We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, get back really briefly to what we've been watching. Uh, I've been binging season five, which is not the final season of Supergirl, uh, just because I'm preparing to upgrade my DVR uh, from my cable company. Oh. So I've got to clear yeah. off what's on there. So I've got season six all recorded on the DVR. I had not finished season five, so I binged through that because I'm also not subscribing to netflix for this month <laughs> i might i might get back onto it in a future month so i'm like well i gotta finish up season five on netflix uh before my netflix subscription for the month runs out and before right. i upgrade my dvr so that's what i watched was season five of supergirl which is like uh, a pretty what was that 2020 was that season <laughs> so i'm oh. going back in time for a while and there we go <laughs> okay what did we watch this weekend we did watch things. Well, the new Moon Knight came out. Yeah, well, that's I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, which is excellent. I oh, loved good. it. Good, I thought good, it good. was great. His okay. So his accent sounds fairly bad to me. This is Oscar people, Isaac. Who's Isaac, playing. Oscar Isaac, which I know the character a little bit mm -hmm. based on a little research I've done, and I think maybe I've read less than a handful of the, those comics. So okay. you know, I know a very little bit about Moon Knight, but uh, so. It sounds a little not great to mm -hmm. me, but I have been told by people on TikTok who live in <laughs> England that it is, in fact, just fine. <laughs> accurate nobody... to some certain region, no doubt. Right. Yeah. Accurate. To, you go, it sounds like it's coming from this area okay. or something like that, which is fine. But even if it's not fine, mm -hmm. the character is not supposed to be English, I don't think. I thought ah. he was supposed to be American. But, but doesn't he um, have multiple personalities? He has multiple personalities. So... so... <laughs> His this personality could be yeah. English, but he just couldn't be very good at it. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. I really liked it. I watched it with my wife, which was a huge mistake. Oh. Uh, she didn't understand what was happening, okay. and I wasn't going to sit there and try to explain it to her while we were going through. But I could tell that she wasn't engaged. So I have taken to watching these things first by myself before anybody else watches them. Mm -hmm. So that and I thought she would like this, but she in it so that's fine i'm just gonna watch it with the kids who do like it um but yeah so far the first episode thought it was great if you if you're an all disney plus subscriber and like marvel uh and even if you don't necessarily like marvel all that much this one is got some of the most uh shakespearean action you've ever seen so if okay. you know about how Shakespeare and that era mm -hmm. did all the action, it was all because they yeah. it was plays. Yes. They couldn't do it on on the on scene, you know, on the, on the stage. Yeah. It was all done off, like offset. Huh. So there is action. It does happen. There's a little bit of a car chase scene, but for the most part, it, it's just following this dude around and getting to know the character. So I thought it was. I, I was excited by it. I thought okay. it was a, it was very good. I've actually gone back and rewatched Hawkeye. I've rewatched uh, uh, Loki. I've rewatched, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Wandavision. Uh, Wandavision a number of times. I love that show. But uh, I'm and even uh, Falcon the Winter Soldier, which in my opinion is the weakest. <laughs> Everybody one. Everybody seems uh, to say that and not not particularly love Falcon and Winter Soldier. I, I actually I quite do. enjoyed it. <laughs> I, it was, but you know, the thing is, is like on second watches, I, I like them better mm -hmm. than I did yeah. the first time, especially Hawkeye, which I really felt like the first episode was too busy mm -hmm. and that set the tone for the rest of it being like a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. If they had just like pared down that first episode, I think it would have been better. And that's mm -hmm. what this has. Moon Knight has a very pared down, ah, okay. we are only looking at this dude. Eh. And we're following him around. There's a little bit about the bad guy in there, but for the most part, and then yeah, Ethan Hawke, man, the guy, Ethan yeah, Hawk. that's right, <laughs> I mean, the guy who said he would I mean, never do a superhero movie, and here he is, here he is doing a superhero <laughs> movie. I think it's, I think it's great. So you know, you know, it, Marvel. Everybody's like, oh, Marvel sucks, and then they're, they're like, yeah, you said Marvel what? sucked, and then now you're in a Marvel movie. Yeah, well, you know, this character oh, is the, different. Uh, I'm like, the oh yeah, all right, people behind the scenes, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. 
<laughs> All right. So, um, what else? H- have you watched anything else? Anything else? Uh, I have nothing worth commenting on. So there we go. That's that's what I, we've been watching this week for our wonderful. We watched the thing. Turning Red. Did I talk about ah, that already? Turning Red. That nope. was good. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't that watched that good. yet either. That's uh, that's perfectly serviceable. That is family Pix- Pixar's movie. latest movie. It's. It, I'll tell you what. As metaphors go, mm-hmm. this one. Can get shoehorned into just about anything. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> you know, you know, it, it's got the whole puberty aspect, mm-hmm. or maybe LGBTQ okay. aspect. It's got you could you could shoehorn it anywhere. <laughs> it it it, it kind of works. It, Life changes, not entirely feeling like you fit in. That that's, that's exactly sort of a, what it okay. is. I'm like, I'm like, I think Disney is like, this seems to hit home with people. I'm like, you think? <laughs> Like I, I mean, I, I think like everybody hit 2020 and went. I'm going through a life change. Yeah, I, I wish there was a, I wish there was a movie about this. <laughs> hey, WandaVision. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good stuff. So yeah, we saw some other stuff too. I just can't remember what the name of this. So that's fine. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, do we want to talk about Silver Baton now, or we're we going to wait? Oh, let's go through our listeners of the week that's and right. do it right after that. All right. So if you're here for the Silver Baton. Pr- Early review, impressions. first impressions, first, first impressions. impressions. Let's That's call it first impressions. Yeah. yeah, because future people who are listening to this podcast and say, "That's not true about this show for me, John." Shut. I up. mean, there's already go been back to your hole. Two updates to the app and a promised one coming out next week. So the thing, yeah. things are definitely going to change. The things are in flux. Yes, yeah. right. Uh, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. Ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Go to avrant.com, find our old podcasts, and uh, go tell us how terrible we are for not knowing things from the future. Mm. Sorry, future people. That's right. It sucks to be us, I guess. <laughs> if only we were more precious. We very often don't know things that happen like the next day after the podcast it's happens. It's weird. It's almost we just, like there isn't the spice. We just don't to have... To give us the sight. <laughs> don't have insider information. <laughs> don't have early access to things. That's that's not who we are. We're, we're just a couple guys talking about it. We're not those guys. Things. Yeah, we're not those guys. I will tell you, though, if you are in the future right now with and holding in your hand an 8K Blu-ray disc mm-hmm. that is a new format that is different mm. than Ultra HD, I have eaten my, my hat at some <laughs> point. Because <laughs> I, I yeah, I'd be surprised I have, I, if that comes, I am, but... I have just written an article yesterday that said, yeah, you should buy 4K Ultra HDs mm. because it is the last video f- disc format that we will ever have. I mean, I'm on and... record saying I thought Blu-ray, not 4K Blu-ray, just Blu-ray might have been the last disc format so i, was... I think it sh- <laughs> other than the h other than hdr right and yes. yeah other than hdr i really don't see any reason why we need to have ultra hd blu-rays uh because you can get atmos and everything else on the blu-ray you can? really 10 1080p scaling up to 4k is and there were already about the BDXL discs that you know could right. go up to four layers and hold not quite as much as uh, uh, Ultra HD Blu-rays could hold, but pretty darn close. So even even on the right. storage front, it wasn't entirely necessary. But right. anyway, we digress. Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, YouTube.com slash AV Rant. Contact us directly. Rob at AV Rant.com. His Twitter's at First Reflect. I'm Tom at AV Rant.com. My Twitter's at AV Rant underscore Tom. That wasn't your player skipping. That was me. I ah, skipped. Just voice. No, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I usually can say the letters A and V back to back. Not in that sense. No. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week. Support the podcast in some way. If you want to do that financially, you can go to avrant.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, which will send you to a PayPal donation site. So we want to thank Raf for doing that this week. Thank you very much, Raf. Yeah, Raf. Thank you very much for the PayPal donation. We appreciate your financial support. We also want to thank our 144 patrons over at patreon.com. And Patreon's a service you can sign up to uh, become a monthly supporter kind of like a twitch subscriber if you're into such <laughs> sure. things why not and uh, every month they'll take a little money from you and give most of it to us so uh 144 patrons down a couple from last week when we had our contest <laughs> or yep. week before it's we also we're into a new month so it always that's happens true. Uh, 
which is fine, 146. But down from 146, we're down to 144. We, including Dale, who let us know that he watches all two hours on YouTube, mm-hmm. and Chris. So thank you very much to our 144 patrons, including Dale and Chris. Yes, indeed. That's patreon.com slash Podcast. if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. And a big thank you to our 144 patrons, including Dale and Chris. All right, I want to thank uh, Jack. If you haven't supported, if you can't find that, uh, support us financially, just do something for us and let us know what it is. Mm-hmm. So Jack pointed out that AV Gadgets needs a favicon. Uh, and Jack, <laughs> the internet's a strange mm-hmm. and wonderful place where favicons sometimes appear and sometimes they don't. So <laughs> it is there. Okay, I have double One checked exists. it. It exists, yep. and it sometimes shows up on my computer yeah. when I open the website, and it sometimes doesn't. It's not even like uh, browser dependent. It's just you're using no, the, same it's the same browser. Same browser. And sometimes yeah. It's there, sometimes <laughs> I'm, okay. So I'm using Chrome at yeah. all times, and it sometimes pops up, and it sometimes doesn't. So I will continue to look into it and try to figure it out but i think it's gonna be i have to sacrifice a goat or something Mm. i really don't know the gods of the internet are fickle uh carl picked up touch of pain on kindle and is eager to read it thank you very much carl i will say that uh like right after i uploaded it uh i told clint about it and he downloaded it and said it doesn't work i was like oh no okay it doesn't work (laughs) so i went and had to uh uh I, I re-uploaded it again, and that seems to have fixed it. And I, I really don't know what why it didn't work. Like there, so when you upload it, there's a previewer that you can use to yes, make sure it yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the previewer worked fine. Okay. And when I downloaded it to the, the a preview from Amazon to my phone, it the preview worked fine. Mm-hmm. But when you clicked on the look inside, yes, it said it was broken. Yeah. When it, you were on the website, yeah. and when he downloaded it to his iPhone or his Kindle. It was broken, okay. but once I re-uploaded it. So, Carl, if you're having any problems, you should just re-download it. So, Touch of Pain is Tom's newest novel, in case that yes, wasn't <laughs> completely clear from the context clues going in there. Uh, yes, a fantasy novel, not part of the Bob Moore series. It's its own brand new thing. So, yes, that's available that's right. on Amazon.com in the Kindle format. So, Carl, thank you for picking that up, and I uh, hope you enjoy reading it. And, Jack, thanks for helping out uh, AV Gadgets, even though technically it was already there, but... But uh, yeah, well, one day maybe it'll get fixed. I, it's good to know that there's something That's uh, right. amiss. So I will continue to work on it. We got notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going during our whatever's going on in the world mm. these days from Miguel, Mark, Tim, Dale. And Dale wanted to know if we have an uh, Amazon affiliates link for AV Rant or if you should just use the affiliate links on AV Gadgets instead. We don't have one for AV Rant. You can use the one for AV Gadgets. That'd yeah. be great. If you, uh, that, I would appreciate it. Uh, Chris Allen, who wanted to thank Rob for pointing him to where Sofa Baton had requested shipping info only in your Kickstarter inbox, not via an email like everyone had expected. He received his X1 last week. So, yes, Rob had told me about that. I think we talked about it on the podcast. But we got Miguel, Mark, Tim, Dale, Chris, and Alan. Thank you for thanking us. Yes, I'll say the names one more time. Uh, Miguel, Mark, Tim, Dale, Chris, and Alan. Thank you all very much for those notes of support and uh, gratitude for keeping the podcast going. Uh, Once again, there were people who said similar things on Twitter that I just, I don't go back through Twitter and collect all that anymore. I keep it to what came on it came in on email so a blanket thank you to everybody for the support it is very much appreciated a thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions and since alan just talked about the uh, sofa baton x1 that he received last week uh we also got ours last week so uh yes. yeah we're gonna give um early early first impressions well Really, I'm going to give early, early first impressions. Right. Uh, and then, as mentioned last week, uh, David, one of our listeners, wrote in with his early impressions last week. And Tom and uh, uh, so I have spoken to uh, Andrew via Twitter, but then Tom has spoken to him more recently with updated yeah, like right takes before this podcast from Andrew. <laughs> like, Andrew, like who five uh, minutes ago, <laughs> writes for uh, AV Gadgets, by the way. So that's that's who Andrew is, since he's hasn't been a voice on this podcast just yet. I'm sure it'll happen rather quickly one day soon. Uh, so anyway, yeah. The Sofa Baton X1. So let's see. Let's start with... I'm going to switch over my camera on YouTube so that you can see a bit more of this. Uh, so so goodbye to Tom's face for just a moment. But uh, yeah, that's just the uh, the box cover that it comes in. It's a, you know, it, it's a box, but it, it seems to be of decent quality. So that's good there. And then on the inside of that box, uh, you will see first the wand uh, right away. So that is the main Sofa Baton remote. Now, I want to say right up front, you could... 
lose this and still use the Sofa Baton X1 because everything that is important about the Sofa Baton X1 is in the hub, not in the remote. The hub is everything. The hub sends out the infrared and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi commands, not the remote. You can point this remote at whatever you want. It's not going to do anything without the hub. The hub is what sends out all the commands. Uh, the hub is where all of the programming is stored. It's not stored in the remote. The remote just synchronizes with the hub. And you can use the hub with the smartphone app. The smartphone app will replicate the screen of the remote on your smartphone, and you can use it that way. So you don't actually need the wand. So with that said, um, just to give impressions of the hardware itself of the wand that you're holding in your hand, it feels nice. I'll say that right away. Uh, it certainly feels higher quality plastic than the Sofa Baton U1 that was out much earlier and only cost $50. This is going for $190 on Amazon. Right. Right, which is where you can right. buy it now that the Kickstarter is over. So feels nice in the hand. Uh, I mean, it's just sort of a uniform shape all the way up and down. Uh, so one of the things that David uh, mentioned when he wrote in with his impressions was that he didn't particularly love the button layout. Uh, he thought that having the transport buttons, the play, pause, fast forward, rewind buttons uh, pretty close to the bottom basically required him to shift his grip a little bit more than he wanted to. Myself, I didn't find that to be particularly bothersome uh, because the shape of the remote is uniform. I found sliding my hand up and down the remote not to be bothersome to me, but if somebody else doesn't like having to shift whatsoever, I can see what he's talking about. Uh, as everybody is mentioning online, the feel of the buttons themselves as they click is nice. It feels high quality. They do not feel like they're going to wear out. The uh, physical buttons um, do light up, but only these ones sort of in the middle, the uh, colored buttons at the very bottom and the... Um, the like left, right, up, down, and OK buttons. Those don't light up, but the screen lights up and the buttons light up. Uh, the screen lights up for 10 seconds, and I have not found any way to change that duration or alter how bright it is. Um, so one of the big criticisms that David had was when you pick up the remote and when you just physically pick it up, we're used to the harmonies and even the U1 that responded to being picked up. They have a little accelerometer mm. inside and they wake up. This as far as I can tell, doesn't even have an accelerometer inside. Um, you have to press something on it to wake it up. So even if you're just quickly trying to change the volume, that very first click of the volume button is not going to do anything besides wake the remote up. Then the second click will begin to change the volume. So uh, in David's opinion, that was almost a deal breaker. He's like, yeah, when I need to press a button quickly, it needs to respond right away. I don't want to have to press it. And you do have to press it and wait just a moment for it to establish its radio wave connection with the hub because if you click really 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 fast it's still not going to respond you click once wait just a moment and then click again and it responds so in david's opinion that was a bit of a deal breaker again i wouldn't from myself call it a deal breaker uh but it is a little bit of an annoyance and i don't believe it's something that a firmware update can fix a firmware update might give you the option of changing the duration that the screen stays on uh but if it doesn't have an accelerometer built in, there's no way to like magically give it one of those via a software update. So that is perhaps something to be aware of there. Um, yeah, the criticism I have, and it's something that we predicted right from the beginning, uh, your screen is controlled 100% by this scroll wheel. Uh, it's, right. it's a spherical, not just a disc, it's a spherical scroll wheel, but it only goes up and down. And then it does click in as a button to activate whatever you've highlighted on screen. Now, if you highlight something on screen, like your devices... If you want to go back to where you were, right, if you go into a certain device and have its commands up on the screen, if you want to go back, you have to go to this button that's in the top left corner. And that definitely requires you shifting your grip or using two hands. I also don't think it is completely self-explanatory. If you just handed this wand to someone who had zero familiarity, uh, familiarity with it, I don't think they would necessarily know that this little back arrow up in the top left corner it's a weird place to put yeah that, right? like why it isn't beside there's space physically on the remote to put it yeah. beside the scroll wheel why it has to be all the way up here i'm not entirely sure also this off button that is in the top right hand corner 
that is exactly like the old harmony off buttons. It only yeah. has anything to do with the activities. And it is once an activity is on, the off button turns off everything. But it is not a power button. It does not toggle the power if you have uh, selected a particular device. It does nothing outside of activities. So those two things are things that I don't necessarily think are self-explanatory. Uh, it's one of the reasons I wouldn't just hand this to somebody with zero instructions and expect them to know how to use it right away. Um, so, I mean, that's basically the hardware side of it. I don't have too many criticisms of it. I'm not sure if, uh, uh, Tom, if you were following in David's notes, if I missed anything that was about the hardware specifically there. Oh, I there. wasn't. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, he mentioned, uh, so, I mean, this is getting more into the hub and using the app because everything really boils down to the app. And as mentioned earlier, they've already done updates to the app and they are continuing to do updates and they put out a warning that there's going to be another update next week. And it's to fix some certain things that have been, you know, really, really common criticisms of it right from the get go. Right. So Andrew's biggest criticism, well, first of all, he loved the backlights. That was okay. one of, that for him was great. He, yeah. he liked that everything and was backlit. And that's an upgrade over the Sofa Paton U1 that has no backlighting yeah. on the buttons. Yeah. Uh, he said that, that it feels quality and everything yep. else. Uh, the biggest problems he had were that the um, the app, like you're, I'm sure you're about to say or right. whatever, you know, if you're not, if you mistype something, if you in any way you know, you have to put in, like, you could, you can't just write, write Xbox in there and then choose which Xbox it is Indeed. that you have. You have to write Xbox Series X or the, it won't even come up. Right. Like, I think he said he put an Xbox and it said, you know, Xbox One and then Microsoft Xbox. Those were the two options well, he had. He had to put everything in right. or something like that. Um, uh, <laughs> he also said the Philips Hue lighting integration, which they had already said was uh, going to be problematic. Mm hmm is problematic he said that it, it found it like it was really easy to to tell it that it had uh phillips hue lights okay um which is great but then it can only find two of them and not the other like 12 he has right. so. so yeah getting a bit into the the setup it is all entirely done via the app on your smartphone if you do not have a smartphone or tablet you're not going to be able to set this thing up there is no way to do it via a computer you have to use uh an app for your uh, android or ios device that is the only way to use this thing um now some people have uh, mentioned that just getting the app paired with the hub to begin with has been a little bit problematic. That was actually uh, something that uh, David mentioned because he had seen those criticisms as well. He's like, no, in his case, getting it uh, paired to his network and connected via Bluetooth to the app was no problem. But I had the issue where uh, my Bluetooth connection because uh, it begins with a Bluetooth connection from the smartphone directly to the hub before the hub has been uh, set up on your Wi-Fi network. That Bluetooth connection was fine. It, it found the hub right away. It let me uh, connect my smartphone to the hub right away and then enter my Wi-Fi credentials, the password for my Wi-Fi. And, so, and it only works on 2.4 gigahertz, by the way. It does not work on the 5 gigahertz band. And they strongly recommend that they have uh, you have your phone set uh, to be connected to your 2.4 gigahertz band and not your 5 gigahertz band, just in case that creates any problems. But hmm. I had the issue that a lot of people have described online, which is once I had it paired and once I had the hub connected to my network, then it gets you to like it dumps you back to the opening screen again and gets you to log back into the hub from your smartphone it kept telling me there is no hub can't find one mm. check your network settings all that stuff what i had to do was um go into you know the app tray of my iphone and flick up to completely close the app right not just uh, close down the app, but like stop it from running in the background then relaunch it and then it found the hub just fine but a lot of people don't always go into their system tray and fully close their apps. I mean, completely rebooting your phone would work too, but that is something right. that has been a problem and I ran into that issue. I ran into the other issue, which they have already promised is what they are attempting to fix in the next firmware update, which is learning commands from your original mm. remotes. Uh, you do that not with the wand. Like I say, you could lose the wand and be perfectly fine because you actually point your original remote at the hub the top mm. of the hub, you point it right at the middle of the circle in the top of the hub, and they say to point your original remote perpendicular, point it straight down at the top of the hub. Yeah, that's real hit and miss. <laughs> it's really, really unreliable at this point. Um, not 
completely non-functional. I got it to work with some commands. Uh, but yeah, it was really, really hit and miss. But that, like I say, they've already specifically mentioned that as being uh, a fix in the next firmware update. So by the time you're listening to this, maybe it's not a problem anymore. Fingers crossed that it's not a problem anymore. So here's where I'll just say, here's the general overview. If you already have a Harmony remote and you're used to thinking in Harmony remote terms, which is let's load in all my devices, let's configure my devices a little bit ahead of time, then let's set up some activities, and I'm used to using activities as opposed to one device at a time. If you're already used to that, then this is like, I wouldn't say a first generation Harmony, I'd say like a second or third generation Harmony, like Harmony the way it was prior to being purchased by Logitech. That's, that's sort of the feeling I have from this first generation Sofa Baton X1. This is the first time they've done it as a hub-based system. Um, this is the first time they've done it as an activities-based remote. And I feel like that's sort of where we are. And they are clearly working on it. So I don't have the opinion that, okay, straight out of the box on day one, it's not as good as my Harmony Elite, okay? I'll just flat out say that. But... right. I see a lot of potential here. And I this doesn't seem to be a company that's like, well, we put it out there and now we wash our hands of it. Good luck, everybody. No, like they are actively working on improving this thing. So I see a lot of potential here. And is it the equal of a harmony on day one? Absolutely not. But I think with time it could get there, but there are some things in the hardware that, you know, until version two comes out, like where that back button is placed and not being having an that's accelerometer, right, yeah. you know, like those, yeah. those are hardware things that can't be fixed with firmware. So in terms of setting things up in the software, there are definitely bugs and quirks. David, he's like, yeah, it crashed. Button assignments didn't stick. Um, you know, <laughs> that the overall UI is just like, yeah, sometimes you're going backwards and forwards and some of the language isn't completely clear what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, that's all true. That, that is absolutely all true. And again, those are things that hopefully will get fixed over time. But if I had any advice, if you've recently picked one of these up, you absolutely have to have your devices set up the way you want your devices set up before you put them into an activity. Because the biggest problem I had with this remote was that I entered some devices, I set up some activities, and then after that I decided, oh, you know what, there's a change I'd like to make to one of the devices. I'd like to remap a button, I'd like to change its power on, power off commands, that was the big one, was um, like on my television. I was like, power toggle is fine, because I was just trying to do things quickly. I'm like, it's fine, it works. And then I was like, actually, there are discrete power on and power off commands in the database for my television. Let's switch to that. As soon as I did that, and of course, my TV is used in all of my activities, all my activities broke. <laughs> it did not, you know, update things within the software to like account for the change I had made in the way my device powers on and off. It was like, nah, your activities now, um, when you're done, you're just going to have to press off and turn everything off and then start the next activity, you can't just switch from one activity to another without powering everything off in between because you changed how the power commands work and we weren't able to update all that behind the scenes without you right. erasing your activities and starting over. Um, the, the thing that is not intuitive at all is that I just said, set up all your devices the way you want them before you put them in activities. I'm now going to double back on that and say, don't put too much effort into making the list of everything on the screen exactly the way you want it. Don't spend too much time create, trying to create macros or anything inside the devices because none of that translates over to the activities. It's completely pointless to customize your devices because all of the customization you want to do is in the activities. And so this is where I'm going to say, if you want to set up the Sofa Baton X1 and hand it to your parents, I wish that on the very first screen that comes up, you could just erase the devices option. Because a lot of people are going to go, well, I want to turn on my TV. So I'm going to go to the device and I'm going to select my TV from my list of devices. And I'm going to turn it on that way. And maybe they figure out to go back to the activities. But when you go back to the activities and start an activity, your TV was already on. So now it's going to turn. So it off. it's going to screw things up, and if things look the way you want it to look under devices, that doesn't automatically translate over to the way the screen looks when you get to the activity, like say your watch TV activity. Like 
I wish you could just erase devices from this front list so that the only thing they could go into is activities uh, because that is where all the customization happens. There are some strange things like in activities, you can have both short and long presses for every hardware button. So the obvious one is like the fast forward and rewind buttons. Maybe a short press is the skip you know, 30 seconds, and a long press is actually fast forward. But how would anyone know that besides the person who programmed it, right? Now, you can have all of those commands duplicated up on the screen, but one of the things I really didn't like that I found super tedious about setting up the activities is in Harmony, when you went through the software, it would prompt you to start to set up some activities, right? That would come up on the software and say, okay, now that you've entered a few devices, let's set up some activities that use those devices. And then I don't know if they curated it behind the scenes or what all went on with the software team, but it would populate the screen of a Harmony remote with the most likely commands. Like if you have a Blu-ray player as part of an activity, it would put the eject button on the screen, right? They're like, that's a button you're gonna want. On the Sofa Baton X1, as the software is today, there are precisely zero buttons added to the screen automatically. Every command that doesn't get mapped to one of the hardware buttons, you have to put it in there manually, one at a time, <laughs> and enter every single one on the screen for every activity. So that, of course, is, is tedious. I would say if you are an impatient person, you are going to hate the Sofa Baton app. Not only is there that tedium of having to do things one at a time that you would hope might be a little bit, you know, curated for you and automatic, um, there is a lot of waiting. There is a lot of load times because like I say, everything is actually stored on the hub not on the remote. So every change you make gets uploaded from the phone to the hub and then to the remote. So there's a lot of waiting for things to synchronize and load screens and the little spinning wheel on your screen while information is sent from the hub back to your smartphone app. You know, the next time yeah. you open it, like there's a lot of waiting around. So it's not the slickest thing ever. It is not the most right. user. At least with the Harmony, you can make changes. Like if you, you if can you do it all in the software around. all at once and then do one synchronization. Well, you could, but even if you have the remote and you're like, you know what, I want this button That's right. to be whatever, then you could you could sync resync the remote sure. to the hub, and then that you couldn't make massive changes, but you could make quality of life yeah. changes like that. You couldn't remap a button, but you could change the order of your activities mm -hmm. you could on the screen you could change the you know you know the order of uh you know, commands within the device right. or something along oh, those well, lines. Oh, well, one of the other big problems I ran into is I reordered my list of activities. I didn't change any activities. I didn't change any commands. I just changed the order that they show up on my screen. Yeah. Oh, did that cause a bug? Because now it, it just like, it thought it was still the original order, even though the labels had changed. And I basically had to erase all my activities and start over. I had to do everything kind of three times on this remote yeah. setting. It up. So my, my overall sort of take early impression advice is if you're a power user who enjoys tinkering with things, who is patient with technology. You, I am not. <laughs> you can do a lot with this remote. You, it, it is yeah. it is quite capable. Um, oh, I did want to mention on that whole entering your devices to begin with. Um the way it is right now, if you search for your model number, your model number of television, let's say, the way we're kind of used to things happening, especially with like the Harmony software is, it would go, oh, well, here are the whole list of devices that are close to that model name in our database. You know, pick one right. of them, Wh which one of these looks closest. So you could do something like, if you have an LG OLED, you could enter like, you know, OLED C1, and it would be like, well, did you mean, the OLED 65 C1 AXUP, you know, like the full model number, you would get that type of prompt. You go, yeah, that that's the one I actually meant, even though all I typed into the search was OLED C1, right? Not so on the Sofa Baton X1. If you enter a model number that it doesn't like recognize in its totality, it's going to say, well, uh, what brand, what type of device, and let's try a few commands and maybe it's one of these command sets. That kind of makes sense. I would say somewhat less user-friendly in that is if you actually type in the full specific model number and it is one that's like, yeah, we know exactly what that is in our database. It doesn't 
give you any warning. It just uploads that device to the hub right now. As soon as you search, like you enter the model number, the full model number and press search, it immediately uploads it. And you're like, wait a second, I'm not sure if that's the right one. It's like, nope, that's the one. That's what you're getting. <laughs> and that was particularly... Done particularly problematic with my Apple TV 4K because I searched for Apple TV 4K and it's like, yeah, we got that, immediately uploaded it. Well, it was, I don't know what version of the remote commands where the home button didn't work. And the home button is a really important button on the sure. Apple TV. Now, if I used their icon in the Sofa Baton app for the Apple TV 4K, that was the correct code set. But when I searched for it, it gave me the wrong one, but it didn't give me a choice of which version Apple TV 4K do you want. It was just like, yeah, that's a device we recognize and immediately uploaded it, which resulted in me having to delete that one and put on the correct version. So it's things like that. If you're a power user and you're patient, it is it is certainly the best alternative we have to the old right. Harmony remotes, not right. you can't buy one, unquestionably. But... If you are impatient, if you, uh, you know, do not like having to do things over to get it to work the way that you want, if you hate the idea of I might set up five activities only to discover because I wanted to change the way things power on and off or I wanted to reorder them on the screen, I had to erase them all and start over again. If that sounds like utter hell to you, then you are not going to enjoy setting up this remote and just wait. Just give it a, yeah, give it a couple Yeah, give it a while because they are definitely updating. And I would say this is not a remote that you can just hand to anybody without some amount of instruction. You're going to have to tell them about that back button in the upper left corner. You're going to have to tell them the way that activities work and to basically avoid ever pressing the devices button. <laughs> you know, you're going you're gonna to have to do a little bit of that. So, um, yeah, th that's, that's my overall take on that. Early impressions. And there you go. Yeah, so I, as I mentioned last week, I have two remotes. One that I bought for myself as if something happens to my Harmony, I will have a backup. Mm -hmm. The second one I bought for my parents, uh, in case something happened to their Harmony, yeah. they would have a backup. And as I mentioned last week, something has happened to their Harmony. The buttons have not been working correctly. Mm -hmm. The touch screen hasn't worked at all, I think, at this point. So they they were talking about how basically they had to talk to their Echo and have the Echo do stuff. And once the Echo turned everything on, then they were able to do some things. You know, they, they used the, the, the remote for the sound bar they have to control the sound, mm -hmm. uh, the volume, and then they can still control channels and stuff with the remote. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I'm surprised you can't do all that with the with the app. And mm -hmm. they looked at me like I had lost my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, you know there's an app, <laughs> They right? do not. They're, they're <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and they downloaded the app and my dad's looking at it. He just pressed the button and everything turned on. He's like, ah. oh. I'm you like, don't even I'm need like, the wand. Yeah. I, I'm not that being said. I do not like the Harmony app. The Harmony app right. is not as easy to control things with as the no, wand no, no. is. But this is a far cry from me having to go over there and deal with this sofa sure. nonsense. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, I, you it is the to... patch that I was looking for. Yeah. Um, so one last real quick thing is on the Harmony remotes, I do like that they have that help button. That has definitely yes. helped when trying to troubleshoot things with my parents over the phone. I'm like, just press the help button and it walks you through on screen. Is this on? Oh, it's not. Okay, is it on now? Yes, did that fix the problem? Yes, it did. And that was yeah. great. Okay, there is a thing uh, on this sofa baton. If you go down to the bottom, the last, so there's activities, then devices, then set. And if you go into set, there is a thing down there that says fix. So this is not as easy as a help button, but there is fix. Sure. Now there is fix power and fix input. And you go, oh, okay, great. They're just sort of mimicking the help function. Oh, no. No, they are not. This is perhaps the most confusing thing I've ever come across because initially looking at it, I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? What this is, is if you go to, say, fix power, you're going to be able to, like, choose, you scroll to choose which device, and then there's on or off. You need to set this to what the device is presently. Like, let's say you started an activity and your TV didn't turn on for some reason. Well, then you need to find your TV in the list and say, oh, actually, you click the button to choose on or off. Actually, it's off right now, right? It should be on, but it's actually off. And you highlight that, at which point precisely nothing happens. There is nothing that helps you. What now you can do is go back, choose a different activity 
and then it will be like, oh, now that you switched activities, but you informed me that your TV is actually off when it should be on, now I'll turn the TV on. Because I wouldn't have normally turned the TV on just switching between two activities because I thought it was already on. But you informed me via the fix function that it's actually off. So now that you want to do this other activity, I'm aware that your TV's off. So I'm going to turn it on for you. It is maybe the worst help, but at least there's... But I'm like, I wouldn't even try to explain it to somebody. I just tried to explain it to everybody you on this podcast. You just explain it to me and I don't really understand no, no, it no. either. So, so yeah. Essentially, it's useless the way that it is now but i i want it because somebody's gonna say oh yeah there's that fix command i'm like yeah that is the least intuitive least helpful help that i've ever seen this was something you should should have copied from the harmony all right let's get let's get, let's going, get going here uh we've got some comments from listeners gorinder heard rob mention maybe you still have a, a nintendo wii when we were talking about av receivers that don't up convert analog video signals to hdmi anymore well just in case anyone found themselves in that exact scenario there's an, there's the wii 2 hdmi adapter for eight bucks mm -hmm. probably cheaper than the whole new av receiver gorinder thinks but think. you know Accessories for less. Mm -hmm. you never know. <laughs> also, he agrees with Rob's recommendation of Shore's SE215 in ear monitors. He's used them when he was a used to be a drummer, and they do a great job of blocking outside sounds while sounding clear and accurate. It did take him a moment to figure out exactly how to loop them around his ear and have them fit snug, though. Mm -hmm. Lastly, he and his wife both enjoyed our joking about here's to another 14 years, and now they're correcting each other about exactly how many years it was when that phrase was actually said. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> my wife loves to correct my stories in the middle of my stories because I'm not being exactly factually accurate. That's right. But I will tell you, if I do that to her, <laughs> she is straight up mad. <laughs> she loses it. <laughs> she's like, she's like, I'm trying to talk here. I'm like, I know you're, but you're not saying it right. She's like, whatever. It's close enough. I, but that's why. Okay. Good for the goose is not good for the gander, mm -hmm. as they say. Uh, you guys can argue about that too, Grinder. Mark heard us discussing John's zap pop pop problem with his NVIDIA Shield and Outlaw Pre Pro. Mark wanted to check if John might be using any wireless audio kits, perhaps for a subwoofer or a pair of surround or a Zone 2 speakers. Mark has a Rocketfish wireless audio kit that would cause popping sounds whenever there was a change in the audio signal. So there's another possible possible we need to figure out what this is so that we can talk about it <laughs> right and know it. we need to put this one on the in the toolbox mm. like if you have a pop sound what could this possibly be this could possibly be it so okay good right, uh questions will so first question is from will will is using the apple tv 4k which he put into the sofa baton and gave him the wrong one <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say that but who knows it could be he yeah, probably with his BenQ HT uh, 3550 projector, he has the Apple TV set to, excuse me, output 4K SDR by default. And then he uses the match setting for frame rate and HDR. When he watches a movie or TV show and then goes back to the menu, there's about four seconds of a, black, a blank screen and then the image reappears. Is this normal? And is there anything he could do to reduce how long the screen is blank? Isn't this the case that the Apple TV 4K's menus are like in like 444 HDR and 4K? Well, I mean, the, the menus are in whatever you've set as your default output. So he's chosen okay. 4K 60 hertz SDR as his default output. And that's what the menus will be in. Um, so this is a case where, you know, you go to watch a movie, it goes to 24 frames per second instead of 60. Sure. So okay. there is a new HDMI handshake there. And that's all this is. There's a new HDMI handshake going on. The projector is a little bit slower at redoing that HDMI handshake than a lot of flat panel TVs are. Although there's some flat panel TVs that are kind of slow at it too. So the four seconds of blank screen is completely normal. And all it is is every time there's a new HDMI handshake, like when you switch from SDR to HDR and back again, or when you change frame rates from 60 frames to 24 frames and back again, that's exactly what's going on there. So nothing strange but if it bothers you the actual way to not have that happen would be to turn off the match frame rate and the match dynamic range settings right. in the apple tv 4k now of course what's right. going to happen there is 
everything is going to come out in the same format now. It is not going to come out in 24 frames per second unless that's what you set as your default. You set everything to be 24 instead of 60. Now something like a game that should be in 60 is not going to be in 60. It's going to be in 24 unless you manually change it. But it will prevent that changing of frame rates in the new HDMI handshake. It does a good job of putting everything into an HDR container. So if you want to leave it at 4K60 HDR all the time, it's not the end of the world. You might see some judder in things uh, because I'm not sure how great the BenQ HD 3550 is at what would be called reverse 3-2 pull down, which is recognizing in a 60 hertz signal that it was originally 24 and doing reverse 3-2 pull down to get you back down to 24 and showing it without judder. I'm not sure how good the BenQ HD 3550 is at doing that. If it's good, then, you know, even outputting things at 60 is not going to look too bad. But usually the reason we want to switch to 24 is to get rid of judder. So that slow panning shot looks smooth instead of slightly jerky in its movement. So if all you do on your Apple TV 4K is watch movies and TV, you might just set the default to 4K 24 HDR and the menu will look a little bit stilted in its movement because it's coming out at a low frame rate and you definitely wouldn't want to play games that way. But all of your video content will look nice and smooth and judder free if by default you just stuck at 4K 24 frames per second uh, in HDR. And like I say, HDR is not really a problem. It does a good job of putting everything in that container. Okay. Ari. Ari had to downgrade his setup uh, to just a sound bar. He purchased a Klipsch sound bar, and now he's trying to sort up, sort out how to get all of his sources connected and make to make uh, the whole setup as simple and user friendly as possible. There's an HDMI HDMI ARC or ARC or audio return channel mm -hmm. port, so connecting the TV was easy. But he also wants to connect his turntable and be able to use AirPlay or at least. Bluetooth. The turntable seems to be the trickiest part, aside from the HDMI ARC port. The, the Klipsch soundbar only has optical audio input and a 3.5 auxiliary jack. Mm -hmm. There's definitely no phono or <laughs> plugs. Yeah. So how does he uh, connect his turntable? Well, I'll tell you what Andrew did when he... Re he's Hopefully by the time you guys are hearing this podcast, the review will be up on AV Gadgets, but he reviewed the mono price... Um, turntable okay I, it doesn't really have a name ah. like it's very it's very strange like it doesn't have a model number mm -hmm. i mean there are model numbers yep. but they are just literally numbers it, it's it means nothing to anyone so it's just called the belt driven turn i don't know anyways the <laughs> mono price one there's three there's technically two of them and one of them comes in two finishes okay so uh and the only difference between them is the cartridge that it comes with. Sure. So he got the one that has the wood finish with the higher cartridge, the higher quality cartridge from Audio Technica. Uh, whatever it is. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't review it. But what he did is he bought the Fosse, uh, like Phono Preamp. Phono Preamp. Okay. Yeah. And use that. So you could do that here and then. I think it probably, I don't know what the connections it has on the back. It certainly has got RCAs, which can go into an RCA to 3.5 millimeter yeah. and go into that auxiliary port, which is probably how I would connect. Yeah, uh, I thought very much along the same lines, which is I thought of Emotiva's uh, separate sure. phono preamp. Uh, they sell theirs for $120. I'm not sure how much the Fosse is. Probably I'll less. Find it. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> usually I'll Fosse costs less. But uh, Emotiva's. Um, phono preamp it is a very nice unit in that it's got lots of configurability right if you have moving magnet or moving cartridge it's ready for either of those um if you have various impedances some more esoteric turntable with a different impedance uh it's got little dip switches to change all of that and yes you've got the grounding pin on one side so on the input side you've got the grounding pin and the phono input and then it's just standard stereo rca output uh that you would plug into an RCA to 3.5 millimeter adapter cable and you could plug that into your sound bar. So really all you need is a phono preamp of some sort. Uh, I'm pointing to the Emotiva one. Tom's mentioned the Fosse one. So either of those would do the job. That is, of course, assuming you already have a turntable, which it sounds like uh, he does. But um, if you don't, for some reason, already have a turntable or you were looking to change or upgrade your turntable anyway, there is the option of buying a turntable that already has a phono preamp built into it and just has regular stereo RCA outputs that come out as line level instead of the weaker phono level. 
uh, and could therefore just plug directly into the soundbar with an RCA to 3.5 millimeter adapter cable. So I like Audio Technica's turntables full stop. They're the ones I always recommend anyway, and they're the ones that very often get rebadged <laughs> by other brands who are just uh, licensing it from Audio Technica. I love the LP120. Uh, that one goes for $400. Uh, yeah, that's that's a fantastic one that, um, or actually, the LP120, normally, that one goes for $350. They have a version of it, the LP120, that has Bluetooth at well, as well, and that's the one that goes for $400. Now, if you wanted a wireless connection to a turntable, you could do that with your Klipsch soundbar. They have Bluetooth input. They'll accept a Bluetooth source, so you could actually take uh, Audio-Technica's LP120 Bluetooth version for $400 and connect it wirelessly or get the regular version for $350 and connect it via line level. If that's too expensive, they also oh have their God. LP60, which is $200 for the LP60. That is an actually an, uh, an automatic turntable you push the button and it you know uh, raises the uh, tone arm and puts it down on the record for you and that one's only two hundred dollars for the lp60 so uh that's that's the way you could do it it's the fossey audio box x2 phono preamp it's got tubes ah <laughs> so if you want tubes this has got tubes <laughs> so it's uh once you stop typing i will put the link in there okay you. there you go there's the link what's the price uh so yes, sixty nine dollars. Oh yeah, there you go. That's Fossey for you. Seventy bucks. Seventy bucks. Yeah, it's got. Let me look at the back here real quick because I didn't see the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got RCA outputs. Of course, uh, yeah. And it's got a grounding plug for the input. Screw. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And there you go. So there you go. Yeah, those are your. How those to are some connect for you. a photo uh, player, a uh, turntable to a soundbar. <laughs> He'd also like to still be able to use headphones. What would we need to make that clean and easy? Uh, mm. Did he say that this thing had Bluetooth or it didn't? Well, so the soundbar has Bluetooth in. It does not have Bluetooth in, in, out. Not out. Not so, out. So uh, you'd have to go out from the TV then? Question mark? No. Well, does it, if, does it even if your television has a headphone output, because some do and a lot don't, uh, but right. some do. Some TVs have a headphone input. So one option might be to actually plug all of your sources directly into your television uh, if your television has a headphone jack output and, and use your television as your switching device for all your sources. You change inputs on the television. Then you could just rely on either HDMI arc or the optical output to connect it to the soundbar. So the soundbar is just sitting there only ever getting its signal from the TV. And you're actually sure. plugging everything into the TV and using the TV as your switch. And then if your TV has a headphone jack, that would be the way you could do that. Yeah. But if your TV doesn't have a headphone jack, then, um, I mean, really all I could think of is you're going to need some kind of receiver or pre-pro. That's kind of the only way that we could do this. Um, I'm not sure which Klipsch soundbar he got. Some of them are two-channel only. They're, they're just a two-channel soundbar plus a wireless subwoofer. If that's what you got, you could get a stereo preamp. That would be one way that you could come at this. Again, I was thinking Emotiva. So like Emotiva's uh, PT1 stereo preamp is $400. It has a very good headphone uh, amplifier built into it, a headphone jack on the front of it. And then it's got optical and uh, analog connections on the back and Bluetooth input. So you could use this as what all of your sources plug into and then just have its stereo RCA uh, pre-outs going to your soundbar if it is just a stereo soundbar. You wouldn't really be sacrificing anything that way. Uh, if not, and you still want something small and sleek, I was thinking like a Marantz Slimline receiver. Uh, but you're looking at $700 for the basic 5.1 uh, NR1510. You know, that's a $700 Slimline Ava receiver. Has the headphone jack, of course, on there. And what you would actually do here is probably set it so that um, you can say, okay, when I have inputs coming in, does the sound come out of the AV receiver or does it pass it through to the monitor HDMI output? Because that's in the settings. You can uh, set this to uh, output to the monitor HDMI output. And you might actually do that to feed your sound bar instead. That would be the way to have this sort of in line acting as your uh, source switch and your headphone amp and then outputting the sound to your sound bar. But that's a bit of an expensive solution. So I'm kind of hoping your TV just has a headphone jack. 
I'm wondering if it had uh, RCA outs, you could add uh, something there too. I mean, yeah. I just but I mean, not if you want to preserve 5.1, then you kind of no. need an HDMI output. No, 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 no. no. I, I'm hearing you, but I'm wondering. Yeah. So. So it depends a bit on yeah. which clip soundbar you have exactly. If it's yeah. just a stereo one, then anything with RCA preouts could work. But uh, if it's a surround sound soundbar, then the Marantz, I mean, it doesn't have to be a Marantz. I was just thinking you want something small. So the slim lines, I mean, you could absolutely right. get a 5.1 Denon receiver for a lower price and be able to do this too. Yeah. All right. I give up. I, I was trying to see the back of a, a OLED or something. So I had an idea of what... What kind of outputs I, you might expect or inputs you might it's, expect? It's there. very hit and miss TV but to TV. I just can't. I can't even get a picture of the back of a, the back panel. Right. <laughs> so to look at. Luke. Luke asks, is there a non-OLED 42 or 43 inch TV or monitor with good viewing angles, 120 hertz refresh rate, good contrast, and at least HDR 600 performance? <laughs> So you want a gaming monitor? <laughs> that's what I'm guessing. More or less, what... yeah. Yeah, but so, but it's uh, that forty-two, forty-three inch size, which you're not going to find a ton of monitors, actual computer yeah. monitors at that size. You'll find them listed at that sort of diagonal, but they'll be the ultra wides. Uh, so finding just a regular sixteen by nine computer monitor of that size, that's why he's like, "What about TVs?" And he wasn't super up on TVs. Um, so the forty three inch size, I mean, there aren't a ton of high end options at that size to do four K right. one twenty and good HDR. But there are a couple. So uh, a couple that fit this bill are Sony's X eighty five J. That does not have local dimming, but it is a backlight, not edge lighting. Uh, so at least it's a uniform backlight back there. No full array local dimming, but you get a backlight. Um, you get a, a nice panel on that. The 43-inch size is using an IPS panel. So it does have the wide viewing angles that he talked about wanting, but it supports 4K 120. It gets nice and bright, like seven, 800 nits bright. So good for HDR, certainly would match up to HDR 600 specs. Uh, the contrast ratio is not fantastic because it is IPS and doesn't have any full array local dimming, but for $650 on sale right now, uh, that is one of the better options. Now there's a caveat to that that I'll get to when I talk about the other option, which is the more expensive Samsung QN90A. <laughs> That's the flagship of their 4K series was the QN90A. That's going back to 2021. Uh, but that does get you lots of zones of full array local dimming. It gets you their wide angle viewing filter that they put on there it gets super bright well over a thousand nits and uh does does all the things now that sony x85j and the samsung qn90a they use lcd panels where the sub pixels normally we talk about red green blue rgb mm -hmm. and that is normally the way sub pixels are ordered red green in the middle blue on the other side for whatever reason, these ones have the subpixels ordered BRG, blue, red, green. They put the green on one side and blue and red to the side of that. And unfortunately, there's an impact to that because of the way our eyes work. Our eyes are most sensitive in terms of how bright is this pixel? We base that pretty much just on the green subpixel part of it. That's the way our brains work. It responds to the green the most. And when the green is all the way to one side of the pixel, and then the other two are to the left of it, particularly when you're reading text, it can look a bit off. It can look a bit like blurry or jagged or almost like it has a little tail on it. Like there's a, a little shadow before. The, like there's a weird thing that the BRG subpixel structure does to our eyes that can make text not look that great. Then another caveat is that the X85J, the Sony that I mentioned, doesn't natively handle 4K 120 at full 444, uh, no chroma subsampling. And 444 is what your PC is going to be opening. In fact, your PC is going to be opening an RGB signal, but that's the same as a 444 signal. And the X85J at 120 hertz can't show that to you all at once. <laughs> it basically does interlacing, shows you half the frame and then the other half of the frame sequentially after it. So the QN90A, it does handle 4K 120, 444 and RGB signals just fine. 
it has that wide viewing angle filter, which works to kind of smooth things out a little bit. It, it generally looks better on text and that than the X85J does when used as a computer monitor, but it still has the BRG pixel structure and it doesn't look perfect on text. Um, mm. Yeah, it's like, I'm not complete, I can't, completely be gung-ho about it if you want to use it as a computer monitor with particularly small text, which if you want a 4K resolution might be one thing that you're looking for. So it's things to look out for. That's basically the warnings of it. But yeah, th those would be the two to look at. Okie dokie. Mm -hmm. On Robert, Rob's advice, he tried the Sony X85J and was indeed bothered by the way text looked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from a greater distance, it actually looked okay, but used as a computer monitor up close, it almost looked like there were holes in the text, like there were pixels missing. <laughs> so would the more expensive Samsung QN90A look a lot better? And if and what if he scaled back on his desire for 120 hertz and HDR600 performance? Is there an option under $500 that can do at least 4K60 with HDR while making text look better? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I alluded to this. The QN90A, I do think it looks better for text than the X85J, uh, but not perfect. Um, if you're able to, like, test it in the store or easily return it, I think it's it, it's better enough that I'm not going to say don't waste your time, but I'm also going to hedge my bets and give you the warning that it still might not be completely satisfactory. So I'm sorry that it's a little bit wishy-washy there, but that is genuinely how I feel about it. You might actually be happier going with the $500 step-down model in Sony's lineup, which is the X80J. Uh, the X80J is, again, IPS, so it's not going to have the greatest contrast um, and black levels, but it has a regular RGB pixel structure. The text looks sharp and good on it. I didn't mention it in the first section because it does not do 4K 120. It stops at 4K 60. Uh, it also does not do super bright HDR. Tops out at about 400, 450 nits. So it's not going to meet HDR 600. So it didn't meet the original criteria. But if you're scaling everything back and you're like, I'm okay with that because I'm paying the lower price, the X80J might actually make you happier because it has the better pixel structure for text. Um, the one thing I will warn you on the Sonys, you need to put it into either uh, game or graphics picture mode. Those are the only modes where it is going to handle 444 correctly, even at 4K60, not 4K 120, 4K60. You need to be in either the game or the graphic picture mode to handle 444 correctly. So you definitely want to do that. Okay. On Samsung's uh, product page for the QN90A under the specification for HDR, they list Quantum HDR 24X. What is the heck does 24X refer to, he asks. I have no idea. I honestly can't figure it out. Uh, if you look at the QN90A and the step-down QN85A, uh, the QN85A is not as bright. Its contrast is not as high. And yet it has the exact same quantum HDR 24X rating uh, as they list for the QN90A. And then if you go up to the 8K models, like the QN800A, which is actually a little bit of a step down from the QN90A. It's just that you went up to 8K resolution instead of 4K resolution. Well, they list that one as Quantum HDR 32X. So mm. I have no real idea what they're referring to. Maybe it's a processor thing? Maybe it's the... But I honestly don't know. It's clearly not referring to the brightness or the contrast, which is what would be important for HDR. So I, I can only guess that they're referring to a processor, uh, That, but I have no idea what it actually means. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That sounds very exciting. Yeah. Alex. Alex has a basement home theater set up, and he's really not satisfied with the base. Base. The room is 23 by 19, but it's L-shaped with an opening at the back of the room on the right to a to the hallway that leads to other rooms of the basement. The ceiling is seven and a half feet high. And it's all laminate flooring with a sliding glass door directly behind the seats. He's got a projection set up with a good amount of space behind his main seats that face the screen. There's also a love seat facing sideways on the left wall. So he's got clip speakers up front. Mm -hmm. He's got a projector. He looks like he's got some corner trapping on the left. Uh, a panel or something on behind the speaker on the right. Uh, he's got a good amount, like he said, a good amount of space. There is uh, more corner trapping uh, on the back left corner on top of the second subwoofer. So the front subwoofer <laughs> is in the, f just to the inside, well, 
between the the right speaker and the center channel yeah. and the 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 back subwoofer is in the back left corner yeah so they're not uh and on the front right wall there is to on the front right of the corner there is where the stairs go up back kind of yeah, yeah, you yeah. know back into the room okay and he's got kind of panels kind of place have i'm saying haphazardly i do not mean that as an insult don't be insulted i just mean he's got them put in places which is exactly what you i would normally suggest you do you put them where you can because he can't always put them in exactly the yeah. right place it's not all and like he's perfectly got, aesthetically symmetrical yeah he's got panels around mm. and some corner traps and he's he's looks like he's following the stuff he's also got on that left wall he's got another couch that's on the wall above that but not high enough to actually be behind the heads of the people i mean not, not low enough to be behind the heads of the people but the couch looks like it's high enough that that won't matter he's got some of that foam nonsense that's actually covering a window ah so it's more of a blocker than yeah. anything else so a speaker's eclipse reference, the tower is in a large center up front. He's got a rug in the, for the seating area with a thick pad underneath. He's got four two-inch thick uh, Acoustamac panels that he's put on the side walls, a couple of DIY corner base traps that he made with Roxel. He's also filled the windows on the left wall and the back wall with Roxel and has some pyramid foam panels over those. Those are the foam ones I was mm -hmm. just talking about. He's never been happy with the overall, overall sound quality, but he, it's really mostly the bass that has bothered him. If he turns up the volume, it sounds boomy and slow. He can get it to where he hears some of the deep bass, but he never feels it, and that's what he's really that's really really wants. He's made sure to close all the doors and even invested in the mini DSP two by four HD. Uh, that was hit with his pair of SVS PB12 NSD subs. So he decided to try a subwoofer upgrade. Went with a pair of eighteen inch Dayton Audio. Uh, Ultimax DIY models in their sealed enclosure. He powers them with a Behringer amp. He was completely underwhelmed by the change in subwoofers. The same problems remain, so he tried using all four subs, even though he really doesn't want more than two in this room and wants to use SVS subs in other rooms of the house. He put a lot of work into re Room EQ Wizard with all four subs in his mini DSP, but he was never, never able to achieve smooth lines. He wrote in the low frequencies with his subs uh, or his... Uh, well, he wrote, uh, yeah, with his subs or with his left center right speaker. So uh, I was just cluing me in that maybe he's trying to run those full range. Okay. And then uh, when the graphs in uh, Room EQ looked better, it never sounded good and never delivered the kick in the chest bass that he really, really wants. So what to do? Is this all become a room, all because of Room Acoustics? Would adding a whole bunch of room treatments solve this? He doesn't care about the look, so a, a whole bunch of six-inch six thick panels would be okay. He tried asking Gick, and they made room treatment suggestions, including on the ceiling, but he wouldn't want to mess with installing heavy panels up there, so would some thicker pyramid foam panels on work okay the ceiling absolutely no. not that one will answer right don't, away don't that, bother that one, with that, that. Was easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah if you look at av gadgets i will put a link in here but it's i have an article about why foam panels don't work mm. and if you look at if you just compare two inch thick foam versus two inch thick uh insulation you could just see how little base they actually absorb mm. like it falls off so fast so is he completely off base and what he actually needs is different gear his receiver is a denon x3300w so maybe add amps change speakers change subs what's going to fix this okay so as rob already alluded rob thinks that he's running these these clip speakers full range and that may be part of the problem uh, and I mean, so, when you're talking about the kick you in the chest region, if you've been playing your towers full range, that that could definitely be part of the problem. So you remember, so everybody thinks the kick you in the chest comes at 20 hertz and lower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nope. I, I don't know why they think this, but this is what they think. This is what they think. Because it feels happening. real low and you can barely hear a note down where that kick you in the chest actually does happen. But it's not right. as low as you think. Yeah, so it's really closer to 50 yeah, around that area. Yeah. It's around 50 hertz. So if you have crossed your speakers over as l low as they maybe have suggested that you that you should because of what if they say that they're they they respond down to 30 or sure, 40 sure, or something sure. like that, then you have you are relying on your speakers to provide to you this kick you in the mm -hmm. chest bass that they cannot do because first of all that was an optimistic <laughs> that, that was an optimistic specification but second they're not placed correctly Indeed. now 
you have problems with placement full stop because your room is not rectangular and enclosed. Sure. Well, I mean, just that harder this, to predict placement. Yes. Yeah. That mean that that said, you have done the work. You have done gone right. through and and really done the work. But if you are even if you're not running your your speakers full range like Rob thinks you are, I'm betting you're crossing your speak your your speakers over too mm. low. Uh, for yeah, because I mean, whatever there is reason. no chance that what you need is a subwoofer upgrade. Like mm -mm. when he says, do I need new gear? There's no problem with the signal coming out of your Denon. Yeah. That's not the no. problem. The amplifiers to your clip reference premiere speakers, that's not the problem. And the there, subwoofers it, themselves are not the problem. I'd be, I'd be honest with you. I wish that we had an autoresponder on this podcast that was like, that, if, <laughs> it, that somebody, if the sentence involves amps and clips, the answer immediately <laughs> pops out as no. <laughs> <laughs> like it just immediately popped out right. like 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 both of like you could hear our voices just go no yes and then they'd be like but but my clip speakers aren't getting loud enough should i get an amp no like, <laughs> what you know it just just keeps saying no until people stop asking that question but also um, for yeah. this range of bass that you're talking about the kick you in the chest yeah. bass and maybe the you know the the rumble the jelly in your eyes bass even lower than that um Trying to treat, uh, so theoretically, you could treat that with passive room treatments, but realistically, that isn't right. the solution for bass that low either. With really thick bass traps, usually in the corners just for logistic reasons, you can help some of the 100 hertz, maybe as right. low as 80 hertz, where very often there's a crossover issue, like we actually talked about with a listener last week. Um, but for the bass that you're talking about, the 40, 50, 60 hertz bass, trying to treat that passively is, it's a losing battle. I mean, like I said, yeah. theoretically, you could have panels thick enough to do it, but that's not really the issue. So there's two things, two ways to attack this, because like I say, you've got everything that you need already there is no reason you should not be able to achieve really nice performance base oh, in this pb 12 should have should have they should have been this fine. room well like yeah he says, you didn't need to upgrade subwoofers like full yeah, stop yeah. like we should have but i mean we, we, we could have helped you there easily see but, the intuition where he thought okay absolutely. maybe what i need is bigger higher well, output subs he made them and he's like well that didn't fix it <laughs> right so that said okay so in my mind you can take whichever pair of subs you want and put them in the other room that you want to put. Sure, them in. sure, sure. I, I, if the Ultimax ones are smaller and no, fit better, <laughs> yeah, or whatever, or you're prouder of them or whatever, right. that's fine. Do whatever one you want. But step one: set all your speakers to small. Cross everything over at eighty hertz. Well, is this or completely step one? Because I'm thinking again with our bottom up thinking. Um, yeah, I, I want so. No speakers playing. We're going to start with only subwoofers playing. Um, and in fact, I'm tempted to tell you to let's just try one subwoofer. Because all I want is for you to get the proof in your head that this room, <laughs> without okay. a big change and without a change in subwoofers, is capable of delivering kick you in the chest bass. Now, with only one sub, we're only going to be trying to do that at one seat. But I am convinced that with one of any of the four subwoofers you own, including sure. the SVSs, you would be able to, with one sub at one seat, get full-bodied kick you in the chest bass in this room without changing because, anything else. Because you said you don't care about looks, yeah, um, you should have the complete ability to move these subwoofers around. That's as right. Well. That's so what I'm talking uh, about. <laughs> if we're having subwoofer issues, so. I mean, I, I'll think I'll, I'll even take it one step back from what, what Rob just said. I think you plug your phone with a sweep in it mm -hmm. into your sub into a subwoofer pick one. Yep. Start playing it through there, yep. and then just walk around your yes. room. Okay. Don't even worry about whether or not it's at your. What we're trying to prove here to you, yes, is that your sub can do the thing that you want it to do. Yeah. In your now, room, as your room your is room. now. <laughs> yeah. All by itself. That's right. Just the one. Yeah. Because remember to. When we talk about dual subs, we're not talking about more output. We're talking about e more even output. uniformity across uniformity. more seats. Yeah. So those left seats on the wall, they're yeah, never going to yeah, be yeah. good. So yeah. we know that, right? Yeah. But we're not trying to prove that right now. What we're trying to say is, you know, you need what your first sub by itself should be able to pressurize your space. Yes. Any of your subs can do that. We know it. Yeah. And particularly you at just 40, 50, it. 60, like it's just not right. a problem for any of those so subs. So start, like, I, I can't, now tell, ask, ask yourself this. If, you have left your seat during a movie when mm. there's action going on and you have walked around your room 
and you to go to the bathroom or whatever, sure, which sure, I know sure. I have done. Uh, and many of these, like my, I had a friend who had a very odd shaped room, one subwoofer, not optimally placed because his wife wouldn't let him move it, and there was a bunch of drama along with that. But when I got up and walked around the room because everything was crossed over where it should be and everything else. I would walk down the hall and suddenly I was I felt like I was inside the subwoofer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so loud. And then I would get into the bathroom and it would get even worse. So if you did not experience that, uh, that sort of feeling, I'm that to me, it would be proof positive that you have a setup issue yeah. going on. So we're going to take the take everything out of the, the equation, right? Your your subwoofer crossover should be turned up as high as it can. Mm-hmm. Right, you plug in or def- on b- bypass. You plug your phone into your a sub. Pick one, doesn't matter yeah. which. Download the suite from audiocheck.net that goes from 100 hertz on down. Sure, and just play it on repeat yep. and start walking around your room until you're like, oh, that's that's what I want to feel exactly at my seat. Yeah. So we're not talking about any EQ. We're not talking about turning the subwoofer up. Any the AV louder. receiver isn't even in the signal chain, so it's no, not base management. It. It's nothing no. like that. Yeah. So once we know that, then I mean, honestly, I'm just gonna point you to my 12-step subwoofer <laughs> yeah, <laughs> setup sure. guide because that that's what sets issue here. Once you can, so this might involve repositioning perhaps the sub at the back of the room or the sub at the front of the room. That's entirely possible that you end up having to reposition one of those subs to actually get things working according to the 12 step guide. But once you have that, once you have this uniform base that is performing across your seats with nothing more than the two of your subwoofers, um, playing in mono they're just playing together there's no different eq for each one there's nothing fancy going on the two subs are playing in mono together and you have now got this uniform bass we're suspecting that you have had your at least your front speakers maybe playing full range or down to 40 hertz or something like that don't do that anymore you know at this point you will now know that the two subwoofers on their own are completely capable of producing the bass that you want so let's not mess that up by introducing more bass producing things let's cross over your speakers at 80 hertz if 80 hertz gives you problems try higher not lower try 90 try 100 and we're quite sure that you can get this sounding the way you want it yeah so i mean like i said there are ways of moving subwoofers there's you can clearly move things around this room. This, these are things that can be done. But the fact that it's L-shaped and it has a hallway and then the stairway up front and who knows what's going on over there means that we can't predict where you should. Yeah, it's not quite your... as easy for the placement of the dual subs. Yeah. But, but since you have done. the mini DSP and the U-mic and the Room EQ Wizard, it, it shouldn't matter. You should be able to dial this thing right. in. Right. But uh, it is going to take a little bit more trial and error. So... You know, you could you could do it one of two ways in my mind. First of all, you're going to change your settings, like we said, change your crossover, start playing with with it from that point. Um, but you can either try to you know keep you know basically turn off the EQ and all that stuff, and then just start playing sweeps and through your room EQ wizard and keep moving physically moving the subs around until the two subs together are producing the yeah. uh, the flattest or the most even line, yeah, yeah, you know that you can, and then use uh, Room Key Wizard, and then use Odyssey is usually the way I say to do it. But you could do it the other way. You could do Odyssey and then dial it in a little bit more with Room Key Wizard. Kind of up to you. Um, I mean, with a mini DSP and all that, but or you can just plop the subs down, <laughs> brute force it, brute force it with a mini DSP and yeah. Room Key Wizard, and then run Odyssey on top of that. It's kind of up to you i think i would do the first thing because mm-hmm. i think that you've got the the ability i mean six inches a foot sometimes will make a big difference and sure. what kind of frequency response you'll mean so you just kind of adjusting them around and looking at the the looking at the lines as they're they're being produced uh because you can do that with room eq wizard which you cannot do with odyssey so nathan nathan and his Wait, wife nathan, recently didn't we miss miguel did i miss miguel and i need to I apologize to miguel because i did neglect to have his question on the list last week didn't make a difference because we wouldn't have gotten it to it anyway but miguel wrote in again because he's like i didn't hear my name mentioned which is a great thing to do if you don't if you know you wrote into us and we don't mention you then double check which is what he did and i'm glad he did so here he is just so you know miguel it wasn't just rob that skipped you i also just skipped (laughs) you (laughs) 
<laughs> Both times unintentional, but it happened you to the same guy. You are apparently very skippable, sir. You are a skippable person. <laughs> now, know what that means? I don't think it means anything about the quality of your character. I just think that maybe you blend in. You're a blender. You're a chameleon. <laughs> Miguel. Miguel set up his open living room. His theater area is 15 and a half by 19 uh, by 8. But it's open to the kitchen in the back. He's sitting 9 feet from his front wall. And in order to keep his front tower speakers out of the way, they're basically in the front corners, which he knows is not ideal. They're very wide apart. Uh, he's got the 5.2 configuration using all clips reference premier speakers and dual H uh, HSU VTF2 Mark V subs. He's got seven Acoustamac panels spread around the room, and he intends to add some DIY bass traps in the in the two front corners behind the speakers. Behind the speakers, one would assume, yes. He's decided that he wants a much more neutral speakers as to narrow that down to his choices uh, to either Ascend Acoustics or NHT. He also wants physically small surround speakers, so if he goes with Ascend, he'll almost certainly use their HTM 200 SC models as surrounds, and if he goes with NHT, he use, he'll use Super Zeros. It's funny that we never really talk about Ascend on this podcast. <laughs> Rob never never suggests Ascend, so I'm sure Rob's going to push you towards NHT, you know, because he doesn't even really know what that who that company is, let's be honest. So given this somewhat compromised room and placement, which would we recommend more highly? Does ported versus sealed make a difference? Are there any uh, of the Ascend or NHT speakers particularly, particularly about placement? Lastly, when it comes to Ascend, uh, both their SE series and the Sierra series are under consideration, although due to price. If it goes with the Sierra series, he'll stick with the bookshelf fronts, not the towers or horizons. So which exact models should he get? <laughs> uh, well. So, I mean, this is tough because there is a big price delta. A big, yeah, big yeah, price yeah, delta. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's so. <sighs> I, 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 in my whatever article I wrote, I can't even remember what the name of it is. Uh, that talked about shopping for new speakers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like steps one through eight were all about getting your room ready before you ever even looked at a speaker. So sure. the fact that you are planning on adding some room treatments tells me you should do that first. Okay. You should do that to begin with before you start shopping for speakers. I, I mean, know that's it's really not the only part. adding corner bass traps. So I going to make a massive difference to the speakers. I, I, I don't know. It's I, not going to make a zero difference. You're right. It's not going to make a zero difference. Yeah. And what you want is you want to you want to end up with your room being where your room is mm. so that you can hear your current speakers and compare them to your new speakers. Now, you're sitting nine feet away, which is not that far, no. honestly. And I don't. In most cases, I would not say that you would need tower speakers in such a space. Sure. That being said, you have not told us the full square footage. You said it's open to the kitchen. Yeah. I mean, your kitchen could be tiny, or your kitchen could be the size of. <laughs> I my mean, house. if we just assume it's like doubling the amount of space in there, so yeah. we're looking at something that's like thirty by nineteen. That's not a small room anymore. No, that's a it's pretty not. big room. So. Why might you want tower speakers in a room like this, mm. even though you're only sitting nine feet away? Well, your speakers still have to play with enough authority to get bass that is, will evenly cross into your subwoofer. Yeah, we're worried about getting hertz. down to the crossover point. We are not worried about the treble. We're not worried about the mid-range because mm -hmm. that'll be fine and they'll yes. get to you just fine. But we're worried about getting enough bass in your room. And so, it's like everything below 250 hertz, I would say, which your speakers are responsible for. Your speakers are responsible right. and from 200 hertz for sure, 250, 200 hertz on down, the room is taking over. You're not hearing direct sounds anymore. You're right. only hearing reflected sounds below that point. The room has taken over at 200 hertz and lower. So it does matter what bass capabilities your speakers have if you're in a substantially large space. So the Sierra uh, bookshelf speakers are quite large. And uh, the Sierra 2s that I reviewed them a bajillion years ago, maybe they were the Sierra 1s. Yeah, it was Sarah ones that you originally reviewed. Yeah, yeah but the I cabinet originally... is identical. They've never changed yeah. the cabinet. They uh they do have quite a bit of bass. Now, is it enough bass for this amount of space? Mm. Ooh, it's a little I yeah, I agree. It's a little questionable. That being said, do they have to stay in the corners of their bookshelf yeah. speakers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, now that you've got smaller speakers, can you move them? further towards the TV so that they're more optimally placed mm. and they are now both closer to you. Yeah. In which case that could make a difference. Um, 
you know, of course, you've always got the option of crossing over your subwoofers higher, but, you know, you don't want to go all the way up to 200 hertz. So, uh, which, I mean, if it were me, and like, there's a couple of questions that you still need to answer before I can definitely tell you which speakers mm. to be looking at. The NHTs are great speakers, yep. and I know you want physically small. Now, like, if you like physically small surround speakers and they're going to be closer to you, mm -hmm. there is no problem mixing and matching everything that you have mentioned here sure to me they sound that the sur as surrounds and hts would be just fine to go with the sierras or the any of the ascend speakers i mean i would say they're they're fine. if you're very critical then going from say super zeros to sierras up front like if you were really critical you'd hear a difference you'd hear a difference between htm 200 se's and sierras if you're very critical but there are right. the sierra but lunas room, they're yeah. the Sierra Lunas, which could are very compact and wall mountable, and those could match with those. To me, the biggest question is how much do you want to spend? Because this is a yeah. huge variance, right? So, for example, if you went with a Sens CMT340 SE series speakers, I have no worries about those in terms of base output, overall output, positioning, nothing. The, those are easily going to work in this room, the CMT340 speakers. You get three of those going across the front. Everything matches nicely visually and sonically. You put HTM200 SEs as your surrounds, and for a pretty low price, you've got a very well-matched, you know, excellent um, uh, set of speakers that are going to contend with this room really, really well. To step up to even just three Sierra speakers across the front, even if you kept the HTM 200 SEs as the surrounds, that is like a $3,000 price difference. This is not <laughs> insignificant. There's a lot, right. uh, there's a big, big difference in that price. Do I think that there's, like, it is diminishing returns. You're not, it, it, these aren't, you know, 300 times better. It's not like, that. but right. I do think they're better. But he asked about how picky are they about placement. The Sierras are not picky about placement horizontally, but they are picky about placement vertically. Uh, that tweeter, the Raul Ribbon tweeter, has narrow vertical dispersion. Now, if your room is somewhat reflective, that's sometimes a help. You don't get as much of a floor and a ceiling bounce. But if you are standing up and walking around, if you want to listen to these in the kitchen and that, Right. They're not necessarily the greatest speakers for not sitting down and listening to them where you're controlling <laughs> how the verticality that you're going for. Mm. I'm tempted to lean towards a CMT340 and HTM200 SE, like very affordable, contends with this room really nicely, but they don't have their super nice looks. They don't have the looks of the Sierra speakers. You're certainly not getting that. If you went NHT, they're easier to mix and match any other lines. They're, they're, they're sure. super neutral across the board. Um, so you can have, say, the C series up front with the Super Zeros. And I'm very, I'm not worried about that at all, <laughs> to be honest. So if you want right. to put more money into the fronts and do that, I'm not worried about sealed versus ported in this room. Doesn't, doesn't make a lick of difference, in my opinion. Yeah. So it's like if, if you want gloss black, like get the NHTs. Like honestly, I don't see a bad choice out of any of these. Right. Um, yeah. I find it a little bit harder to maybe justify going Sierras in here because I'd be tempted to get the Lunas as the surrounds. That increases the price even more. Um, you probably would actually want to go with the Sierra 2 EX so that you do have that bit greater base output capability to really solidly get you down to that crossover point in this open room size. That increases the price again. <laughs> if like, But if the price is no concern and you love the way they look, which I love the way they look, then I mean... There's no there's no bad choice here, but I'm tempted to lean you towards the the ascends unless you want the looks of the NHTs. Uh, I, I have have we been any help at all? No, no, no help we have at not all. Not been any help. I, I mean, the real answer is: traps. can you bring in one pair of each? Because <laughs> that... right. The problem is that they don't have free two way shipping. They don't. The, Neither of the them real, do. That's the real issue. It is an issue. Um, which does begs the question: you know, what about? It's SVS, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't right. talked with them. Right. You know that would they be certainly have free. options too. They have options. They have towers. They have bookshelves. They have uh, small ish, not not as small as NHTs, smallish surrounds. Sure. They have their the satellite uh, and the prime elevations. Maybe the elevations. your surrounds are actually mounted up a little bit high in this room, and having the downward angle would work for you. So, uh, the, you know, they are also a neutral speaker. Yes. I, one of the reasons why I really want you to install those bass traps first, and I know that 
those, you know, you're looking for a more neutral uh, speaker to begin with. And I, I think that's a, that's, I mean, that's generally, that's what I want. That's what Rob wants. And that's what we generally mm -hmm. suggest in a room of this size. Uh, and if you are the type of person who wants to sometimes put the volume up quite mm. high so that you can hear it all over the room, I, I, I want you to put those bass traps up behind these speakers to catch a little bit of that mm, back sure. wave and just to see if maybe that makes your clipshes a little bit better for you in yeah. this room. Because, you know, like, I, like Rob said, it's not going to make a zero difference, but it's probably not going to be a huge difference. But the thing here is you may find that it just you cannot get the volume that you really want out of your out of any of these other speakers we're mm. talking about like you can so easily out of the clips so um you know again if it were the, me, out of this group the cmt 340s are going to come the closest they are out of this group the most right. efficient and the highest power handling out of these options right. So if it were me, I think I might consider ordering some SVS somethings. Okay. Because free two-way shipping. Have it come in, you know, send them up next to your uh, your clip speakers, do some A-B comparisons, and see how you feel about them. Sure. And then know that those are going to sound more similar to the, everything else that you're looking at than the clipshes are. Okay. <laughs> if that makes sense. Nathan. Again, sorry, Nathan, for the psych out before. <laughs> Nathan and his wife recently moved into a townhouse, he says. Le sigh. Mm -hmm. As this is a downgrade for them. In the current uh, setup, he needs uh, to keep his AV receiver on the main floor, which is where he has his TV set up, along with his Ascend Sierra speakers for surround sound. But all of the other a gear is in the AV rack in the loft space above the main floor. And his desk, where he works from home, is also up in this loft space. He got a pair of uh, San Sierra Luna speakers for his desktop setup and uses them for his PC audio. He doesn't want to buy any more gear, aside from maybe a dongle, if it's necessary. And he's trying to keep the PC setup at, at all contained within the loft. So in the AV rack that's next to him in the loft, there's an Oppo 203, which can take uh, an HDMI input and act as a sort of preamp. And then he has a mono... Uh, monoprice monolith 7 channel amp up there with a couple of channels to spare he uses a dell u3415 ultra wide monitor and a dell uh, d6000 dock so that he can quickly connect his laptop to his desktop set up via a single usb cable so here's the problem he can get pc audio just fine by plugging the hdmi output from his dell dock to the oppo and then using the oppo as a preamp to feed the monolith amp which then powers his speakers but when he connects the oppo's hdmi output to his dell monitor he gets an error message that says his monitor requires 3440 by 1440 resolution at 60 hertz and that is not a resolution that the oppo supports <laughs> so can we think of a solution with some sort of hd fury edid device get this working uh you need the video scaler to get it working and i'm not sure that the hd fury can do that uh so i i am just thinking why can we not send video separately from audio like yeah because you sh I, I don't know exactly what the options are going through that Dell dock. Um, but even if you don't go through the Dell dock, is there any other audio output from your computer? Because as long as you can separate the video from the audio, that that's all we need to do. You send the video straight to the it's monitor. It's just two channels, right? I mean, yeah. why can't you just connect a headphone exactly. jack that has RCA output? Or, or like a, a 3.5 to... RCA, RCA into the amp, and Bob's right. You're literally done. Or at most, a, a USB. Um, yeah. You know, little little sound card, right? Yeah. Like, There's a thousand of those. Yeah. At, at most, that's what I'm thinking you need here. So as long as you can set the video output to be separate from the audio output, the audio can then be sent to the Oppo, and you continue using that as a preamp that feeds your monolith amp, that powers your SN speakers, and then the video is sent directly to the monitor. You're not relying on HDMI connection, just one that has to plug into the Oppo because you're worried about the audio part of it, and then you can't get the video through the Oppo. Like, you yeah, just separate yeah. the audio from the video. I, I'm trying to think why that wouldn't work. I'm like, right. is there any scenario where that doesn't work? I can't come up with one. Well, I mean, so I, I'm thinking of, and I, I know this doesn't get, it's not sold anymore. The Cambridge Audio little, it's like an external, sure. you know, and it plugs into 
I think it plugged into the headphone jack. Uh, no, it plugged into USB and then it had a headphone output mm-hmm. on it. And it was just a little USB DAC. Yeah. And yeah. you could would connect that to your well, laptop. There's like the, the Behringer, the Behringer 222, which is like 40 bucks. And it's a, yeah. it's a little USB DAC and it's great. <laughs> that's, that's probably what I would do. Yeah. I mean, I don't really see any reason to do it that way. I mean, what you're talking about, the solution that you're talking about is so that you can plug that HDMI cable all the way through the the Oppo, yeah, like but the, the single solution, connection. that solution out from the Oppo, you would have to plug another HDMI cable into a scaler, a video scaler, who would then oh, scale no, it. That, that is a ridiculously expensive reason to mess solution. with that. But I mean, the yeah. the dock, the Dell six thousand dock, it is set up to be capable of connecting to as many as four monitors, three of them via Display Port and one of them via HDMI. Yeah. And I'm like, why can't we just go Display Port out of the dock directly to the monitor? And you could still use HDMI audio to the Oppo. It's just audio only that you'd set the what's your audio device? It's the HDMI out. But what's your video device? It's one of the Display Ports. Sure. So I even there. So I think that's there the solution. Go. I I can't There's think of why that wouldn't work. Here. There's lots of solutions. Just pick one. <laughs> Matt, Matt is building a new house, and when he says that he is building it, he really means it. He's been a carpenter for 25 years, so this will be the fourth house of his that he's designed and built himself. This one is meant to be their home for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> Excuse me. My throat is very dry. And it's the first time he's been able to include a dedicated home theater. The theater will be 15 by 22 feet long. It's above the garage, and there are no other rooms adjacent to the theater, which should help him in terms of soundproofing doesn't help in terms of soundproofing it does help in terms of getting the sound from your home theater into your actual house because of all the disconnection yes <laughs> so it's not really just soundproofing i mean i'm sure if you're standing outside your house you're, you're you're not going to soundproof this theater you're just far away <laughs> so it's, it's it's a sound isolation difference. that's that's more accurate <laughs> The A-frame structure will result in the upper portion of the side walls having an inward slant and he's included two nooks a uh, smack dab in the middle of the two side walls that jut out to house his pair of eight, uh, DIY 18-inch Dayton Ultimax subwoofers, which seems to be a theme today. <laughs> the viewing distance to the primary seat will be 14 feet, so he plans to include the largest screen size that will physically fit on the front wall said nobody who's ever regretted that decision ever the only attachment uh, to the rest of the house is at the back where the theater opens up into an antechamber where the av rack will be kept and and that in turn opens into a closet and bathroom all of so all of that is in between the theater and the rest of the house so it's not totally detached it is still attached sure but he's got like it's not theater and the door opens directly into the bedroom or something like that it's like there's right. rooms in between this theater and the whole rest of the house yeah so speak it speak it take it, take it from somebody who knows uh sometimes there's not enough room between you and the theater. <laughs> but still this is definitely more okay. isolated so he's got no some, party walls he, he's got some uh some renderings here Mm -hmm. uh he plans on having lots of room treatments it looks like he's got a couch with a looks like a a higher bar with some bar stools behind the couch he's got a seven point setup with it looks like in ceiling atmos speakers on the slanted walls he's got a big screen up front with freestanding speakers on now that is just uh, the rendering that's That's just it's just all a rendering uh on either side and underneath and uh, it looks like outlets all over the place, but I'm not really sure what that's about. And the back does have two doors, one that goes to the bathroom and then, I guess, into the rest of the house. And the other one is for the, the equipment room uh, closet space. So nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's AV rack someplace too. All right, good. And there's another door. Where does that good door go? No, I think we're just seeing through, in the rendering, we're seeing through the back entrance. No, I'm talking about by the closet. Yeah. There's a door that... Well, I think that goes to the rest of the house. Oh, that's the door that goes to the rest of the Okay, I see. And then there's an antechamber. Oh, right. So there's no party wall. Well, there's a party wall. Well, okay, I guess there's not. All right, whatever. Shut up, Tom. I can't. It's not scrolling. Okay. <laughs> Framing is scheduled to begin soon. So he, if he is going to end up with in-wall speakers, he needs to finalize those plans. Aesthetics are very important to him, and he loves the clean look that in-walls with an acoustically transparent screen would provide. But... If traditional speakers would be a huge improvement in terms of sound quality, he's willing to go that route. He wants 7.2.4, uh, and he's leaning towards getting Focal 300 series in-wall speakers, but he'd be willing to consider a pairing Varus Grand speakers since he thinks they look very nice and the prices are fairly similar either way. Mm-hmm. 
So what would be our advice to him regarding in walls versus regular speakers for the setup? And if he goes with Focal in walls, should he construct backer boxes? The answer to that question is always yes. Yeah. <laughs> Since there are no adjacent rooms, he isn't concerned about the in wall speakers leaking sound into other sides of the walls and ceilings. So would there be a performance game inside the theater for having backer boxes? And the answer, of course, is yes yeah so, yeah you want there, there to be backer boxes uh and being a not, carpenter he th this is not a problem this is not a complicated yeah, this is, this thing should not be an issue <laughs> but he's you. right that you you definitely want to plan for it and do it during the framing part of it if they're going to be yeah. installed so absolutely correct about that so are in wall speakers always a compromise uh most of the time my answer to that question is yes Shh. and the reason is is because everyone is, assumes they can look at a wall and know what's behind it and put the speakers where they want it to be. And so what ends up happening is people are like, I'm going to put a speaker here, 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 and here. It's going to work out perfectly. And then they go and they take a stud finder and they try to find, they start cutting into the wall and realize there's yeah. a stud there. They or it's not even a stud, wall. it's a wire, a pipe, a duct. Yeah, yeah. who knows? So in your case, since you are literally building That's the room right. he can put the speakers where you he can wants put exactly where you want them to be um i find it hilarious that one of the reasons that you say that you like the Pyrian speakers is because they look nice. I'm like, the whole point of in wall and in cell speakers is that you don't see them. Well, that's just, he's you saying, know, that, if I'm going to see them, yeah, I need to like yeah. the way they look, which is perfectly reasonable. Right. Uh, so are there good in wall and in ceiling? Uh, well, we don't have to worry about the in ceiling because it doesn't matter. It's just Atmos. But are there good in wall options that you could you could have mm -hmm. here? And I think I mean there clearly are. They and the Focal three hundreds are some of them. I mean, uh, yeah. you weren't here when Lee and I talked about it, but uh, you if you listen to that episode uh, just a few episodes ago, seven ninety nine, uh, Carl, um, you know, went and auditioned the Focal uh, three hundred series and the one thousand series, and he was absolutely enthralled by the three hundred yeah. series. And I mean, you know. Uh, sorry, who are we talking to here? Uh, I got to scroll all the way back to see Nathan. The Nathan. Uh, no, Matt. We're on Matt right Matt. now. Matt. <laughs> Nathan 2.0. Scroll too far. Uh, you know, Matt is saying that he was already leaning towards those, so I assume he's had some experience with it yeah. um, and has liked their sound. I'm quite happy to tell you if that's the look you prefer and you are you are building this room yourself, so you're not going to compromise on placement. And actually, with the layout that he's suggested, if you went in room speakers, traditional speakers, that sender speaker is too low. Um, well, yeah, it is. I don't think, yes. But you've only really got one row of seats, so I don't yeah. care that much. And you're sitting far enough away that I really don't think it matters. But but I think you should get the yes. Folk L300s. I, I think that's the way you should go uh, yes. for this particular setup. I think you should get the acoustically transparent screen and do it the way that you want to do it. Um, and I would put backer boxes on them 100%. I would put backer boxes on them yes. to be completely safe, right to Focal and ask exactly what they want for cubic footage. Uh, yes. But almost always the answer is a three foot tall backer box in a traditional two by four foot stud is is what it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, insulated, of course. And uh, that's, that's almost always the answer, but it doesn't hurt to write to them and double check. Yeah. Uh, like I said, in this case, because you have 100% control over where you can put these speakers and everything else you can build around them. Even you're the kind of person that I would say, yeah, you can go ahead and put in walls wherever you want. Yeah. Because you, I've had like people, you know, like people on Reddit are like, he can, oh, can he I put can the move the studs around the speakers. Yeah. I've had people on Reddit are like, can I put the, can I put the speaker here? I'm like, I don't know, dude, can you? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I couldn't do it because I don't know what's up there, up there. He goes, oh, I'm a carpenter. I'm like, yeah, put it there. It's fine. There you go. Like physically, is it a, a good place for it? It's a great place for it, but you know, there's probably like <laughs> stuff, <laughs> but, but if you know what you're doing, so you're fine. So he has looked at Axiom Audio's speaker lineup, both their in-walls and their traditional speakers, which can be customized with very nice real wood finish options. It seems as though we've been down on Axiom, but only for their prices. However, Axiom speakers are quite a bit less expensive than either the Focal 300 series or Aperion Varus Grand. So that has me thinking, either Focal or Aperion speakers are overpriced or Axiom speakers must not be very good. <laughs> can we shed some lights on that? Some light on that. Axiom speakers uh, were well-loved and bought by me, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, my very first set of speakers were Axiom speakers. I bought the uh, the M22s, the VP100, which is their crappy center speaker, mm -hmm. which I would never recommend. <laughs> and uh, I got the QS8s for the side yep. surrounds and the QS... quad poles. The QS4s for the back surrounds, which I ended up disconnecting 
I left them up there, but I just stopped using them <laughs> because my the, the surround back was speakers were making things worse, which is why I'm so against surround back speakers <laughs> these days. In case you guys are wondering, that's one of the reasons. Um, the the problem with Axiom is that when I bought them, they were a budget leader, and this is why mm. Audioholics was so hot on them for a long time. But then they started increasing their prices slowly over the years, and they kept increasing them. They would change the model name of the speakers, mm -hmm. but the internals of those speakers changed almost not at all. Mm -hmm. They may have sourced different drivers from different places, but from what we could tell, it was the same speaker that was the budget speaker, but now for a higher price. Mm -hmm. And it just kept going on like that until and then they started offering custom finishes and then the prices went through the roof. We were talking, you know, I mean, and, and their finishes are nice. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're not nice and they are worth something, mm -hmm. but the quality of the speaker did not improve over time. Yeah. They just changed the model I, I numbers. I do like for their increasing. in walls and in ceilings that they, they just are a sealed speaker <laughs> they don't yeah. they, they come with a backer box it's integral it's part of it it's not an add-on option or anything like that yeah. uh but i mean in terms of their sound quality like i think they compete with like svs prime series i think they sure they compete with like ascend se series they're they're, they're in that sort of category in my mind which is which is good it's darn good to be honest we just recommended those just like a, like the last question absolutely <laughs> it's so i mean i i don't think they are they are certainly not bad i don't even think they're like lower rung i just don't think they're the pinnacle <laughs> of of well, ab, you know ab, yeah. out. the problem was is that you know when the prices increase your yeah. uh, your valuation of their of their value yeah lowers so because they're like of the delta twice the price of ascends se series that's sort of where they end up falling if you're looking at you know similar size similar output model for model they're about twice the price of ascends se series however they do look nicer, or at least they have nicer finish options, because the Ascend SE series is just very basic flat black. Um, so if you're, you know, putting that money into the finish, then some of that makes sense. Um, you know, SVS's prices have gone up too, so you're right. You know, that value proposition has changed over the years. Um, so things are are closer that way now. So I don't, I have never had any problem with Axiom. They just became less of a home run because their prices became equal to everybody else. And then for a while they were higher than everybody else. Like when you're talking about what I consider to be very comparable performance bracket. Right. To me, the Focal 300 series is a step up. The, uh, the Aperion Various Grand series is a step up. Now, is it a twice as good step up no again we're getting we're starting to get into that diminishing returns area that always happens when you get to the 500 to a thousand dollar per pair of speakers and then you go beyond that it's like it's diminishing returns but there is some improvement to be had so i don't really think either things are true i don't think the axiom speakers are bad or not very good i think they're good I don't think the Focal 300 series that they appear in various grand are drastically overpriced. They are a step up. They are not twice as good, but everybody's speakers that are any sort of step up are going to be into that next price bracket. So right. that's where I land on that. So he'll be powering a setup with an Yamaha RX A3070, at least to start. It can process 11 speakers, but has nine amps built in. He was thinking of getting an affordable three channel amplifier and power his front three speakers with it. Any suggestions? I suggest you don't do that oh really <laughs> well i mean you're you thinking get a little well, fossey amp and power the yeah, surround just backs little, with it just surround back with <laughs> or him. Yeah. How uh, on the yamahas you have, he's on the yamahas you'd have the option of either um you know you oh, can no. power nine internally and then the two that must be powered externally you can set to either the front left and right or the rear presence speakers you know the rear height speakers well he is sitting, sitting 14 feet away from his front speakers yeah 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 so yeah. that's i don't know how uh efficient those uh Focal speakers are so maybe it does make sense to have typically efficient <laughs> they're not particularly yeah. high or low i was going to point you to a, a, a emotiva base x uh three three channel model the uh what is that, that that's a perfectly reasonable a 300 yeah. yeah yeah uh just stop stop there <laughs> so stop there just stop yeah. there because <laughs> I, I will tell you what's going to happen because it happened to me i started with you know, the Dayton Audio amp that mm -hmm. that Rob suggested. It was two-channel amp to power my 
top middle yeah. or surround <laughs> yeah. back or whatever they That's are. Right. I don't remember. And, uh, and I was like, well, if I'm going to do that, maybe I can just use it to power my front left and right and then use the internal amps to do that. I'm like, well, if I'm going to power my front left and rights, I want something a little beefier because, you know, they're the front left and right. But if I'm going to do that, I might as well get a three channel amp. And if I'm going to do that, I might as well get a five channel amp. And I mean, a seven channel amp is only a little bit more. So maybe, I'll, and then that's where you go. So if you're going to do the front three, just do the front three and stop. Yep. <laughs> okay. I know, Agreed. I know, I know where this is going to go, but uh, <laughs> just do that. Yes. And the bass axe from uh, Emotiva is just fine. Mike, Mike previously asked if he should get a Denon X1700H or a 2700H receiver. We said that 1700H would be just fine for a setup, so he got one. It's mostly great, but there's one annoying issue he's having. His TV is a Panasonic Plasma, so there's no 4K or uh, HDMI ARC situation in the setup. His Denon is connected to TV via an AV Access HT Base T adapter, and his mm. main source is an NVIDIA Shield. He uses a Harmony Elite to control everything, and when he starts his watch and video shield activity, the HDMI handshake almost always fails. If he manually switches his Denon to a different input and then back to the shield's input, that gets things working. He figured <laughs> out it, he would just do something like that to the end of the activity startup sequence, mm -hmm. but he says he wasn't able to easily do that in the Harmony software. For the time being, he created another activity just to switch to Heos on the Denon, and then he can switch back to another activity to get the HGCP handshake working. But he, he's sure it's an HGCP handshake problem because his HD base T adapter actually blinks a warning light specifically for <laughs> HGCP problems. So yes. they know it's a They it's know issue. it's going to happen. <laughs> so is there a convenient fix for this? Right now, his startup sequence goes Denon on first, then TV, then two second delay to allow the TV to fully boot up, and the shield gets turned on. Would some other sequence help? Is the HD base T adapter just a bad unit? I would put another delay. I might increase the delay in front of the TV one, and I would put another delay after the TV before the shield gets turned on would be well, yeah, the first like if thing I would do. If he's saying that if he switches the den into a different input yeah. and then back again, have the den and turn on last, right? Sure. Have the TV you turn on too. And, and wait a little bit for it to boot up, uh, turn the shield on, and then turn the den and on last. And that, that alone might work. Uh, because now the source. This is gonna. It, this is gonna be a, very much like playing that stupid game that everybody plays that involves green squares. What's it called? Oh, Wordle. <laughs> yes, it's gonna be trial and error until you get it right. You're gonna but, keep mixing these things around yeah. and and adding delays and stuff until you figure it out, and then you can maybe reverse engineer your way back to yeah. it's to you break it again and then you add a second and then it's unbroken, or you switch the order and it's unbroken. So, um. I think this can be fixed in the harmony. And well, I think there is a workaround because I know what he's talking about, which is with the harmony software these days, when you set up an activity, you tell it, okay, uh, what's the power on commands? You know, what gets turned on? And then what input does everything get set to? And for some reason, uh, even though you can add additional button commands after that part of the activity, yeah. they have removed the power and input button commands. Uh, like those don't show up. You, you right. don't get to choose those. So I know what he's talking about where you're not able to just add the, okay, switch to another input and then switch back. Those buttons just don't show up. Well, there is a workaround you can do, which is uh, you can do this in the device or actually what I did is I, I set up like a dummy device, like another device that doesn't really exist, but it's just so I could store additional uh, remote commands. And in that dummy device, I learned the input buttons from my AV receiver's remote control, right? And now that it's in a different device under learned buttons that you entered, and you can name them something other than input, so that, you know, it's whatever, you know, A, B, C, D, just call them that. That is a workaround so that you can now enter those buttons in your activity and have them as part of your startup sequence. So you can do it via the workaround or just try altering, like I say, have the Denon turn on last in the sequence, and that might be enough to solve it. Yeah, I think delays. And I don't think there's anything wrong with your HDB base T adapter. That's, that's No, I think it's just happening. There's happens. too many things happening yeah. at the same time. 
Uh, Tim. Tim's theater uh, setup is in the small area of his finished basement. He's got a pair of Paradigm CS160 in-wall speakers installed as front, left, and right. And he had an SVS Prime Center and a PB1000 sub. He had intended to add a second sub, but once he told his wife where he wanted to place it, she was not for it. And since he's on, the only person in his house who seems to notice or care, the single sub sounds great to his seat, so he's good with that for now. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I was watching something the other day with and it was just normal, mm -hmm. normal TV stuff. And the music came on and you could just barely feel the couch shaking a mm. little bit. It, it wasn't a loud volume. It yeah. was just like, it was just, it was exactly perfect. And I was like, <laughs> I know nobody else is noticing this, yeah. but I'm like, I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> so the basement has a drop ceiling. So we rigged a second pair of uh, Paradigm CS160 speakers into the ceiling. Its placement options are very limited. And the seats are against the back wall. So no putting the surround speakers uh, so putting the surround speakers overhead pretty much is the only option. But now those in-wall speakers are going to be installed in a different room. So he sees this is an opportunity to get a pair of actual in-ceiling speakers. However, since his seats are against the back wall and his surrounds have to go overhead, he doesn't want to spend too much. So maybe $200 at most. What would we suggest? I am confused as well. Those in-wall speakers. So he has in-wall. I thought he had in-ceiling speakers as his left, as as, as his so surrounds. they are in the ceiling, but they are in wall speakers, like they're rectangular in wall speakers. The CS one sixty, same model as he has as for his front left right. He has just installed them in his drop tile ceiling, firing yeah. downward. So they want to use those CS one sixty rectangular in wall speakers in a different room, install them properly as a zone two or whole house audio, and then he's like, Okay, so now I can get regular in ceiling speakers, but I don't want to overspend. So I know, but these are surround speakers. These are surround speakers. <laughs> so why don't you just leave those ones up there and buy some different Buy ones new ones for the, for the other room? <laughs> That's what I would do. I mean, I, I don't know why you wouldn't take perfectly... I mean, I know they're not optimally placed. They're not even close to optimally But the new placed, ones are going to be where these ones are anyway, so that we're not changing well, the placement. We're just changing we're from them. rectangles to circles. That's where they all are. I mean, yeah, I don't... I, to me... This is adding a level of complexity that I don't think I want okay. to deal with. I, you already put them up there. The, that work is done. All Why right. would you want to do it again? <laughs> well, and now you have to put a round speaker in the square hole. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're going to have to probably buy, buy new, new ceiling tiles because the circle is not going to be or whatever, yeah, but larger than the floor. Why would you do that? That's just extra cost, time, money, expenditure. Just buy another speaker, an in wall speaker, to put in the, uh, put the in other room. Other, yeah, because you're buying something either way. Yeah I, yeah, I really cannot disagree with any of that. Tom is absolutely right. But I'll just answer the question as wrote, because maybe he just really, really wants circles in the ceilings instead of rectangles. I, you know, we're, we're not saying that that's what we think you should do, but if, if that's just the way it's going to be, um, to exactly fit your budget, because I want you to get something that can have backer boxes. I always want you to have back cans on anything that goes in ceiling or in wall. So I would want you to mono price to fit this. I would get the, uh, the alpha series, uh, mono price, uh, six and a half inch in ceiling alpha series speakers, uh, or actually, sorry, the eight inch, I gotta be specific here. The eight inch Alpha Series mono price in ceiling speakers, those are $120 a pair because then you can get for $80 the back cans that go along with, they only have them for the eight inch model for some reason, but that gets you to exactly $200. That combo might actually be very helpful because the back cans come with the framing kit to go in a drop tile ceiling. Like that all comes together. <laughs> is is that's all part of the back can package is specifically for installing them in uh, a drop tile ceiling so that would be a very good option that fits the budget and would sound great uh i can also mention uh the sonance mag 6 speakers that i talk about all the time available at best buy they're going for 170 dollars a pair right now the back cans for those are 60 dollars, so that's put you to 230 dollars, and they do not come with a kit for installing them in the in the uh, drop tile ceiling so that might be a little bit of added expense there too so to hit the budget to have the kit that you need to put them into your uh, t-bar ceiling there uh the monoprice alpha series eight inch model is perfect okay great don't do that <laughs> anonymous <laughs> the hacker group apparently has emailed us <laughs> took a break from uh just a person who requested their name not be said on the podcast which we're more right. than happy to accommodate they're taking a break from 
denial of service attacks mm. on Russia or whatever they're doing these days. <laughs> Anonymous has been using an Epson 8350 projector for a long time now. They are thinking about upgrading to a Epson 5050UB, but how noticeable will the difference be in theory? Being compatible with 4K and HDR should be an advantage, right? But do those things translate into real world differences? They'd be sticking with their 120 inch gray screen for now. Well, yeah, so I, I don't know why you have a gray screen. That's usually fine. That, usually that means that you have, it, you're looking for better blacks in the Which, in the, with an 8350, doesn't. that's not out of the question. It also might mean you have some ambient light, which would be that's a what bigger deal. Think. That would be yeah. a bigger deal. Uh, so your screen size is fine. 120 sure. inches means that HDR should be easily visible mm-hmm. to you. Uh, if you do have ambient light, and that's why you have your gray screen, that you know, is going to cut down your ability to see uh, the the HDR. Right. Will this be a difference? Um, oh, yes. Uh, I mean, it will be. There's yeah. just no, well, there's no doubt. I the mean, black levels are going to be better. The, yeah. uh, the HDR is going to be something. The HDR is the reason for 4K, as far as I'm concerned. Because oh, I, I know see. you're not sitting... As a format. However far you're... Yeah, as a format. As you, I know you're not sitting from this 120-inch screen looking at it going, look at all those pixels. Well, yeah. Because you would, have, I mean, you would have led with that. The 5050UB <laughs> is... It's a 1080p projector. It can use each of those pixels twice per frame. So it's not actually true right. 4K resolution. Yeah. It's compatible with a 4K right. signal. Honestly, I, I want you to put the 4K and the HDR out of your head. That's not the reason to go from an 8350 to a 5050 UB, the 5050 UB is a completely different performance class when it comes to black levels. Yeah. That's the real thing that we're getting. Now, that's why we're a little bit hesitant because if you have a room with a significant amount of ambient light, then you're not going to notice the black level differences very much. But if the reason you got the gray screen was because even in your light controlled as black as you can get it room, the 8350, you're like, okay, my room is really dark, but then the black level from my 8350 yeah. is kind of gray. So I got the gray screen to make that deeper. Well, you are going to see the difference in the deepness right. of the black level of the 5050. It's the con contrast the contrast of the 5050 ub whether it's hdr or not uh, that is very noticeable in the real world it is an obvious upgrade uh from the 8350 to the 5050 ub in black level and contrast now being compatible with 4k and hdr even better but uh but that's the real you can forget about those two things and just focus on black level and contrast and you will see a difference there yeah lastly Anonymous asks, what's the advantage of multi- all I see multi QXT32 over multi QXT? Mm. Uh, number and resolution of filters. Yep. So greater ability to do that. Uh, with the sub EQ, you can EQ two sub separately, which we do not recommend you do, but <laughs> it is available to yep, you. Yep, it's available. But the big the big advantage is uh, the multi QXT, uh, is the number of filters and the resolution. So yeah, if you, uh, if push. you actually, um, like, uh, Audioholics, they've been talking with, uh, uh, one of the technicians from, uh, um, Odyssey quite a bit because <laughs> they're going over mm-hmm. the whole multi QX thing on the PC side. But he's mentioned how, like, when you get to XT32, um, there's actually enough filters in there. There's tens of thousands of filters in multi Q, uh, XT32 so that, uh, like if you're talking about um, the chromatic scale on a piano, like uh, every semitone, there's a little bit more than a filter for every single semitone from from mm. the bottom to the top. <laughs> like that's you you got enough, right? So it's like basically every least noticeable difference that we can detect in a change in frequency, there's a filter for that. Uh, so it's just the resolution of the filter. Now in practice, how much difference have I really noticed? between multi QXT versus XT32, I can't really tell you. I've noticed just, a tremendous no. difference. <laughs> See, but that's the difference between really treating your room and I, I, right. and I mean, it's it's like, it's hard because if you don't treat your room and your room's crap, then Odyssey can't really do much no matter how many filters right. it has. But if you do treat your room and your room is good, Odyssey can really fine tune it, mm-hmm. but that means that the changes aren't really all that like the line is just flatter than it could have ever been mm-hmm. by itself but it was already kind of flat i mean it was pretty good <laughs> <laughs> you know so it's a, almost like a catch-22 when it comes to it but you the difference in a in a room that you've taken some care with is 
the problems that you would have had in this room, the problems that you mm -hmm. could have encountered will be taken care of by uh, Odyssey, almost mm. certainly, uh, unless you have some really, uh, really weird things going on with placement. So yeah, I... That's the, the that's the advantage. I mean, when it comes down to yeah, it, more more filters, better resolution. All right, that's going to be it, Rob. Who do we got left? We have on our list John, Jason, Carl, oh, and take a Chris. Single hyper Schmidt. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, we got four on the list there. Will they'll be first up next week? All right, we've got. Uh, I thank our listeners of the week. I think uh, the. Raf, who went to avrent.com, clicked on the Bias Cup of Coffee link and sent us a PayPal donation, as well as our 144 patrons over at patreon.com, including Dale and Chris. Yeah, I'll say it again. Raf, thank you very much for the PayPal donation, and a big thank you to our 144 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast, where you can go if you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. And Dale and Chris, thank you for being two of those patrons. I want to thank Jack for pointing out that <laughs> AV Gadgets needs a favicon, which I went back and looked at during this podcast, and it is there, uh -uh. and it was not showing up, so I deleted it and reinstalled it, and now it's showing up again, so mm. fixed, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Carl, who picked up my new book, Touch of Pain, on Kindle, which there will be a link to in our podcast. There notes, sure will. So please go get it. And as well as notes of gratitude from Miguel. Ugh bug miguel sorry miguel god miguel you're yeah, just getting gets... what is up miguel why why are we skipped, like this distracted we skipped like a bug flew in my bugs. mouth what is... miguel poor guy he would be in the title if we didn't have the sofa baton x1 review that i know miguel kind of kind of has to be we should call title. it miguel sofa baton x1 review and just really confuse him <laughs> Oh, poor man. guy yeah i mean literally flew in my mouth <laughs> it was an act of willpower not to start spitting all over this i knew that would freak people out i was like <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. all right miguel mark tim dale chris and alan for sending us, sending us notes of gratitude thank you very much for thanking us. yes indeed i'll say jack and carl thank you for supporting like outside of the podcast really but supporting yeah, tom that works that's really who you're supporting there jack and carl so thank you for supporting thank tom you. and uh, miguel mark tim dale chris and alan thank you all very much for the notes of gratitude to us the notes of encouragement are definitely appreciated and a big big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions that's right to get your questions answered all you have to do is ask you ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com unless your name is miguel in which case you'll have to remind us three or four times <laughs> for av rant i'm tom andry and i'm rob h now stay in and listen to something once your question answered send it to question at avrant.com is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.